Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. there. Today I want to talk a bit about retro games. Uh, retro games are pretty popular right now, though I think they're always going to be popular because nostalgia is a very powerful thing. I know over the past 25 or so years that I've been playing video games, there have been a lot of games that have held a place near and dear to my heart that I look back upon really fondly. So I thought I'd start a new series where I take a game that I loved either as a child or a teenager, replay it, and see how it holds up today. Uh, the first game I'm going to do for this is Felix the Cat. Uh, the NES was my first console, and of all the games I had for it, I think Felix was my favorite. It was definitely the one that got the most playtime from me. I mean, I was a 10-year-old girl, and I got to be a magical cat, so that's pretty cool. Felix the Cat was released by Hudson Soft for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1992 and released for the Game Boy the following year. Felix the Cat is based on the cartoon of the same name which has been around since the 1920s. The game sends you on a mission to save your girlfriend Kitty from the clutches of the evil professor who wants Felix's bag of tricks. Rescuing your girlfriend was a pretty common theme for games of this era, and for some reason it continues to be today. However, since it was released in 1992, I'm not going to hold that against it. Felix is a typical side-scrolling platformer, similar to something like Super Mario Bros. As you can see, the game looks pretty good despite the fact that it's now 23 years old. I am playing this on a Retron 5, so it does look and sound a bit better than it does on an NES. While the basic gameplay involves avoiding or taking out enemies and collecting Felix Head coins, there are some extra mechanics that spice things up. For every 10 coins you collect, Felix becomes more powerful, taking on a new form. On land, these are basic with his magic bag, a magician, a car, and a tank. Each upgrade means another hit you can take before you lose a life and ostensibly makes you more efficient at taking out enemies. Though personally, I find the tank is harder to work with than the other forms since you have to shoot in an arc. The hearts in the upper left represent your energy level, which will constantly deplete. If you lose all the hearts, you drop down to a lower form, but these can be replenished by milk bottles, which also come from collecting coins. Despite how much I loved Felix as a kid, I actually didn't own my own copy for quite a while. Um, I remember my mom taking me to the video store so I could rent a video game, and more often than not, I would come away with Felix, again, as opposed to renting anything new. Uh, then one day we were in the video store, and there it was, in the sale bin, so she could finally buy it for me. So anyway, I finally owned a copy of Felix. Unfortunately, this is not my original copy for some sad reason I sold my NES and all of my Nintendo games about a year ago. That was ill-advised, but now I have this one and it looks prettier because it's not covered in Blockbuster stickers. Felix has nine worlds made up of two to three levels each and covers all kinds of different environments. Land levels are the most numerous, though you can also travel by air, where you get to fly with an umbrella like Mary Poppins, in an air balloon, or in a single-seater plane. By water, Felix can row a raft, or even ride a dolphin. Apparently, Felix is a cat who likes the water, as there are even underwater levels where you can scuba dive, ride a turtle, or even drive a submarine. As far as NES games go, Felix the Cat isn't the most challenging. Uh, extra lives and power-ups are plentiful, the enemies don't move too fast, and the platforming isn't that demanding. 
Um, compared to some other games, it was much easier to pick up again. Um, when I played Super Mario 3 for the first time in probably more than a decade, uh, it didn't go so well for me. I was actually pretty awful, like run headlong into the very first Goomba awful. It was kind of mortifying and a big blow to my gamer ego. Uh, I kept at it though, I practiced, I remembered how to use this awful non-ergonomic brick of a controller which is really awkward after having used a great Xbox controller for so long. Um, but I did get better. With Felix, on the other hand, it was like riding a bike. I remembered how to play. I still had the muscle memory. I played it through in a single sitting. I didn't have to use any of my continues. And I had a lot of fun doing it. I think partially that speaks to the lack of difficulty, but partially it's just because I played the hell out of this game when I was young. The game's not completely without challenge. The space level near the end requires much quicker reaction times than the rest of the game. Each world ends in a boss fight. Some are really simple and benefit from all-out aggression, like this fight with a dog on a pogo stick. Others require more careful timing. If you go into a boss fight with a low-powered form, you can make it more difficult for yourself, though there are generally enough coins between the respawn point and the boss to get you up to the next state. So overall, I think Felix the Cat holds up pretty well. It still looks and sounds good, and though it's not the most challenging game that you're going to get on the Nintendo, the platforming is fun, and despite having beat it many, many times before, I really enjoyed playing through it again. Uh, my total playtime was about an hour, so... Not too long, but also longer than most of the arcade type games you're going to find on the Nintendo. Uh, it is getting a little bit rare. Uh, if you're looking to pick up a copy yourself, you're probably looking at $50 cart only. Uh, but I definitely think it's worth it, and it's definitely one of the games from my childhood that I still enjoy playing today. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm looking at another one of my favorites from childhood and replaying it to find out if it still holds up today. The game I played this week was Star Tropics. Star Tropics was released by Nintendo for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990. The game puts you into the shoes of Mike, a young man looking for his missing uncle, the archaeologist Dr. Jones, which I must say is highly original. It ends up he's been abducted by aliens, so Mike has to go find him. The gameplay is quite similar to something like Legend of Zelda. It's divided into two parts. First, there's the overworld, where you can travel around the world either by land or sea, and also visit villages where you can talk to NPCs who may be able to help you. When you enter a dungeon, you're still in a top-down 2D perspective, but the camera zooms in so you're a lot closer to the action. Dungeons are where all the combat takes place. They range from fairly straightforward at the beginning to somewhat maze-like and often require puzzle solving. Movement takes place on a grid, so you can only move up, down, left, and right. There are no diagonals. Mike's main weapon is his island yo-yo, a weapon with a fairly short range. Later in the game, you do get access to more powerful weapons, although using them is based on how much health you have. For example, the Shooting Star, a more powerful weapon with a greater range, requires you to have six full hearts in order to use it. If you have less than six, you're downgraded back to the yo-yo. There are also a number of limited use items you can pick up, like this Miracle Mirror, which will reflect attacks back upon the attacker. 
There are magic items you can pick up which can do various things. You can pick up health potions which will allow you to restore health at a later time, or use items like the snowman doll which will freeze your enemy, allowing you more time to attack it safely. Most magic items have a specific use within a specific dungeon. The part of Star Tropics that I look back upon most fondly is at one point in the game you need to input a code into your Navcom computer on your submarine and it tells you to get the letter that your Uncle Mike had sent you and dip it in water. Uh, the letter was an insert in the game manual so you had to get that out, dip it in water, and then the code would appear which is pretty cool. I mean when I was only nine years old it was like secret agent stuff so that's one of the strongest memories I have about this game even more than the gameplay now that I come to think of it. Combat gets harder in later dungeons as enemies become more numerous, faster, or take more hits to get down, while you stay the same speed for the whole game, besides occasionally having access to better weapons. As the game goes on, it quickly gets more challenging. However, a lot of the time the difficulty isn't really made difficult through combat, but through forced trial and error. There are things like having to walk through walls where you get no indication that you can walk through this wall. So I just, you know, have to go through the dungeon constantly banging into walls trying to find which one it is that I can walk through, which is really more frustrating than anything. Another way the dungeons themselves get harder is that they'll occasionally place you in the dark. While with a lot of them you can track enemy movement patterns to figure out where the safe places to stand are, in some of them you really just have to guess. And then there are things like this. Which just seems spiteful. Checkpoints in the game can be fairly unforgiving. Usually when you die, you're sent all the way back to the beginning of the dungeon to try again. Because of the use of limited use objects, this is pretty much a necessity because they don't want you getting stuck. However, it can be kind of annoying. This graveyard level in particular was annoying as it's filled with a number of false exits and if you take one of them, you have to start again even if you haven't died. Unfortunately for me, Star Tropics doesn't really stand the test of time. I quite enjoyed it when I first started replaying it, but as I went on in the game and it started getting more challenging, it also started getting a lot more frustrating and annoying. I didn't really like the trial and error method of the game. I found that the 2D movement on a grid was very awkward and made the controls feel sluggish. Um, it's just hard to get used to after all of the games with great control schemes that I've played in the years in between when I first played Star Tropics and now. That's not to say the game's without its good points. It does have its charms, uh, the music is really great, and as far as the gameplay goes, I enjoy the boss fights. They manage to be challenging yet still be satisfying as there's not so much of a trial and error basis for them. How long Star Tropics lasts depends on how good you are at it. If you are great or you've got the whole game memorized so you know where all the secrets are, you can probably beat it in about three hours. If you are not as comfortable with the combat or don't know all the secrets, then you're probably looking at six, maybe even seven or eight hours. Um, the unforgiving checkpoints can really draw out the game time if you die a lot. Star Tropics isn't a very rare game, so if you want to pick up a cart, you can probably get it for about $10. It's also available on Virtual Console. So it seems that my memories of Star Tropics were a lot more positive than my actual experience replaying it now. It's too bad, although I can't say that I'm sorry I gave it another shot. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games.
This week I replayed another game that I had played as a child, and I don't think this one is too well known. Uh, that game is Hudson Hawk. Hudson Hawk was released for the NES in 1991 by Special Effects. It was also available on a number of other platforms such as the Amiga and Commodore 64. It's based on the movie of the same name, which starred Bruce Willis as a singing cat burglar. The movie was not very well received. The purpose of the game is to steal a number of Da Vinci artifacts, which will somehow prevent an evil organization from creating a gold machine, which will ruin the world economy. If there was one cause I was passionate about as a nine-year-old playing Nintendo games, it was saving the world economy. Wait. The game has you avoiding traps and enemies in order to get through each level. You can run and jump, though the controls aren't particularly responsive, especially if you're trying to make a jump without much ramp up time. Tapping B will throw a ball, which can take out enemies, and holding B will throw a punch. As I played through, I didn't even realize punching was a thing until about halfway through the game. Very little about this game is intuitive. For example, in this level, you're supposed to reach the end with hitting the floor as little as possible. If you do touch the floor too often, you won't be able to grab the loot at the end. However, there's nothing that indicates this is the case. Also, what are these lights for? Why do they hurt me? I ended up getting to the end, not being able to grab the object, and having to restart the level again. When I played Hudson Hawk as a kid, it wasn't even a game I owned myself. Actually, I borrowed it from a cousin, and come to think of it, I don't think I ever gave it back. But anyway, it's not a game I look on too fondly, as it was pretty frustrating as a kid, and I don't think I even got through the first level before I gave up. Much like the movie, the game is a bit bizarre. There's a number of little oddities, like these flashing coins. Uh, all the way through the game, I had no idea what they did, and it wasn't until I looked up manual when I found out all they really do is add to your score. The game also raises questions like, why is there a kangaroo at the Castle Da Vinci? Here I am in the Vatican, and oh, Yep, I just punched a nun. There are a lot of frustrating aspects to this game. Pushing boxes, which you need to jump over obstacles, punishes you if you push them too far by teleporting the box back behind you. Walking into an enemy not only damages you, but also bounces you around, often to your death. Sources of damage in this game aren't particularly obvious. These things, which look kind of like electrical outlets maybe, took me by surprise when walking past them killed me. Another frustrating thing is that your health isn't displayed anywhere on the in-game UI. You need to actually go into the pause menu in order to see your health. This means when someone hits you, you don't get that instant feedback that tells you that it's damaging you. It also makes it harder to tell when you're low on health and need to be extra careful. Hudson Hawk is not a very good game. Between its poor graphics, finicky controls, and unintuitive levels and user interface, it's likely to be a bigger source of frustration than fun. Hudson Hawk isn't a very long game. There are only three levels, although they can be hard to get through with a limited number of continues and unresponsive controls. However, if you were good, you could probably get through the whole thing in about half an hour. It's an uncommon game, though it's not very expensive, probably because it's not very good. If you want to pick up a copy, you should have your head examined. But barring that, you can probably pick it up for 10 or $15 for the card. Did that guy just throw a cat at my head? Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played through one of the great original graphic adventure games, Maniac Mansion.
Maniac Mansion was the first game published and developed by Lucasfilm Games. Originally released for the Commodore 64 in 1987, it was also brought to PC in 88 and finally the NES in 1990. The game follows Dave and his friends as they attempt to save his girlfriend Sandy, who has been kidnapped by the mad scientist, Dr. Fred Edison. You get to choose what friends to bring along, each has their own special skills and abilities, and who you choose can impact how you beat the game. It's nice to see a fairly diverse variety of characters to choose from in a game that was made in 1987. The game is a point-and-click adventure where you need to explore the Edison Mansion while avoiding its inhabitants, collect items, and solve puzzles. There are 12 commands available to let you interact with the world, like push and pull, read, get, turn on and off. I first got Maniac Mansion for PC in the early 90s as part of a LucasArts adventure bundle. It came with a number of great games like The Curse of Monkey Island, Loom, and Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders. These games, along with a few key Sierra titles like the Quest for Glory series, are what spawned my love of adventure games that continues to this day. And of all of them, Maniac Mansion was the first one I ever played. One of the things that makes Maniac Mansion so great is its fun, irreverent style, which is common to Lucasfilm games. There are a number of references to other LucasArts properties, and the game isn't afraid to make fun of itself or its developers. Each of the playable characters is based on some kind of horror or comic cliché, and the villains are oddballs, to say the least. Dr. Fred's lab assistants are two disembodied tentacles who do his bidding. The game is frequently intercut with cutscenes and timed events which show the interactions of the Edison family. While some of these are just for humor and dramatic effect, a lot of them also give hints as to what you need to do at later points in the game. Now this game isn't all tentacle jokes and putting hamsters in microwaves. It is quite possible to lose. You can blow up the entire house, your characters can get killed, and there's even a few things that will make the game uncompletable, even though it won't necessarily tell you that at the time. Adventure games are pretty hardcore about that stuff at the beginning. One of the more unique aspects of the game is that you can swap between your three characters as you like. Each has their own inventory, and they have to work together to progress, like having one character ring the doorbell to distract a member of the Edison family, while another sneaks into their room. Or one character pushes a button to open a secret door, while the other sneaks through. The Edison Mansion is a weird and wacky place, and it makes exploration fun. There are a number of red herrings and items that you don't really need at all in the game, but if nothing else, they're usually good for a laugh. The ability to be caught by members of the household adds a sense of urgency to the game. Getting caught isn't necessarily dangerous, as it usually just lands you in the dungeons, but the interactions with the members of the Edison family are usually worthwhile. Well, I love Maniac Mansion and it is a great game, I have to caveat this review by saying that the NES version, which is what I played through this week, isn't as great as the PC version. The graphics aren't nearly as good. Also, the way that you control it, using a d-pad to choose from among the 15 commands, isn't nearly as quick or responsive as using a mouse. And, unfortunately, Nintendo required that they change a lot of things in the game to make it more family-friendly. So a number of the lines that had at one point been quite suggestive and funny got changed to something a little bit more bland. Despite the suboptimal NES port, it's still a great game and a must for any fans of the genre. Maniac Mansion is fun, rewarding, and offers significant replayability because of the different characters you can choose from. It also rewards players for thinking outside the box. Though games since may have done the adventure genre better, Maniac Mansion was one of the first and it really set the tone for an entire genre of games. Maniac Mansion provides a few hours of gameplay. If you are a collector, you can probably pick up the NES cart for $10 or $20. However, if you want to play a great adventure game, I highly suggest playing it on PC instead of NES. Unfortunately, it hasn't been re-released anytime on PC lately, but 
fingers crossed, Day of the Tentacle is getting a re-release at some point, hopefully this year, and originally Maniac Mansion was included in that, so hopefully we will be able to play it in a remastered version soon. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played an NES game that I've never played before. He's cute, he's pink, he's always hungry. It's Kirby's Adventure. Kirby's Adventure was developed by HAL Laboratory and released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1993. It's a side-scrolling platformer which sends you on a quest to recover the stolen Star Rod, without which the creatures of Dreamland are unable to dream. The game has seven worlds, each consisting of four to six stages, along with a boss level and bonus levels. Kirby has special abilities, like puffing up and flying through the world, or inhaling enemies, which can either be spat out to take out other enemies, or swallowed in order to consume their powers. This is the first Kirby game I've ever played, and what strikes me is what a unique game it is. There's certainly no shortage of platformers on the NES, and while some aspects of Kirby's adventure are reminiscent of Super Mario Bros. 3, the gameplay is really different. The process of consuming your enemies and absorbing their powers is a really unique mechanic and allows for a lot of varied gameplay. There are about two dozen different power-ups available throughout the game. Some of these include Beam, which creates a chain of light to electrify enemies. Fireball, which engulfs Kirby in flames and makes him charge forward. Freeze, which turns enemies into launchable ice blocks. And my personal favorite, Mike, that allows Kirby to kill all enemies on screen with the power of song. The biggest problem I have with Kirby is that in a number of the outdoor levels, it's much easier to just fly over everything rather than face the creatures and get the cool power-ups. There's very little incentive to actually play properly other than score, and really in a single player game, score isn't an incentive at all. Another thing is that the boss fights can be a little bit repetitive. While you can use some of the power-ups against them, they're usually only good for a hit or two, and then it's just sort of repeating of avoiding a bad thing, catching what they throw at you, and then spitting it back. The boss fights do get changed up at the end of the game. You get access to the Star Rod, a ranged weapon which offers a refreshing change of pace. These fights also offer some much more interesting visuals and a much quicker speed. The bonus levels give a chance to earn extra lives and add some extra amusement to the game, some more successfully than others. Quick Draw is a fun one that rewards quick reaction time but punishes jumping the gun. Egg Catcher tests your ability to selectively catch items. You want to catch the eggs, but you don't want the bombs. Of all the mini games, Crane Fever is the one I could have done without. Honestly, does anyone really like claw games? Kirby's Adventure is a few hours long. Though I found some of the boss fights required a little bit of practice, overall the game isn't too challenging and there are unlimited continues. 
Though I think it's too easy to fly over some levels, if you look over that, it's a really unique game with fun gameplay and interesting power-up mechanics. If you're looking to pick up a copy, it currently price charts for about $20 for the cart, or it's available on the Wii Virtual Console. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'll be looking at one of the more rare NES titles. As someone who loves both platformers and food, this game is right up my alley. It's Panic Restaurant. Panic Restaurant was released in 1992 by Taito for the NES. It's a platformer that puts you in the apron of Chef Cookie, who needs to defeat rival chef O-Dove, who has taken over his restaurant. Using your trusty frying pan, you must clear out the restaurant of aggressive food products. There are six stages in the game, named for different courses, and each takes you to a different part of the restaurant to get it back under control. Visually, the game looks sharp and sounds good, though the soundtrack isn't particularly memorable. The game came out near the end of the NES's life cycle, so developers had learned how to make the most of its capabilities. The platforming action is quite simple. Move, jump, and swing your weapon is the main thrust of the game. At the end of each level, there's a boss fight, which is usually just a matter of getting the timing down. There's also a slot machine at the end of levels where you can spend the coins you've collected to win extra health and lives. I wasn't a huge fan of this, as it could get quite tedious if you had collected a lot of coins. One of the best things going for Panic Restaurant is that it's really quirky and different. The whole game is kind of like a bad food-induced fever dream. I mean, what other game is going to make you fight a giant hamburger or have you dodging killer shish kebabs and exploding apples? The boss fights are some of the more interesting and funny parts of the game, and you'll come up against enemies like microwaves, the aforementioned giant hamburger, Or even a quadruple scoop ice cream cone. Ice cream, how could you turn on me? There are also two mini games you can access in certain levels that add a bit of a diversion. They both involve catching food. One makes you catch fish while avoiding bombs, and the other has you catching eggs. Doing well on these unfortunately only impacts your score rather than giving you extra lives. The negative things about Panic Restaurant is that while it's quite short, it can get a little bit monotonous. Basically you're just running around bashing things with either a frying pan or a spoon. There are some special weapons, but in some cases they're not that easy to use, and generally they're quite rare, so the gameplay does get a little bit stale after a while. One of the special weapons is a stack of plates, which is actually a pretty good weapon. It's the only one in the game that gives you any range. There's also a fork which will let you bounce around kind of like you're on a pogo stick. While this seems like a good weapon, it's actually fairly hard to control and you have to land precisely on top of an enemy in order to kill it. After using it a couple times, I learned that I was generally better off just skipping it. There's also a large frying pan that offers something like invincibility which sends you spinning through the level taking out anything in your path. While the game starts off quite simple, things start moving faster and getting more unpredictable as you go on. 
I found the level with the flying shish kebabs particularly challenging. More interesting mechanics like ice and falling platforms also make an appearance late in the game. Panic Restaurant is a short game. There are only six levels and none of those are particularly large. If you're fast, you could probably beat the whole thing in a half an hour. There aren't many mechanics to master, so it's not a hugely challenging game, although there are parts where you need to master the timing of attacks, and the learning process can easily cost you health or lives. If you're looking to pick up a copy of Panic Restaurant, the currently price starts for $300 for just the cart. Now, it's a fun game, but I don't particularly think it's worth $300, unless you're one of those crazy collector types. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. For this week's review, I put the game I'd be reviewing up to a vote on Twitter. It was between The Guardian Legend, Rockin' Cats, and Adventure Island. The winner, by a landslide, was Adventure Island. Adventure Island was developed by Hudson Soft and released for the NES in 1988. It's a side-scrolling platformer that has you playing as Master Higgins, who has gone to the South Pacific to rescue Princess Leliani from the evil witch doctor. Of course, none of this information is actually covered in the game. I had to look up the manual to find out what the story was about. The gameplay in Adventure Island is fairly straightforward. You run through each level, avoiding enemies or defeating them with throwing axes. You'll frequently come across giant eggs, which can be cracked open to reveal power-ups. These include a skateboard, which allows you to move much faster and lets you take one more hit before you die. A flower gives you bonus points for collecting items, and a magical honey girl offers invincibility. There's also an energy mechanic, which would later be reused in the game Felix the Cat. Higgins's energy will continually drain and needs to be replenished by eating fruits. Certain slip-ups, like landing on rocks, can take a chunk of your energy away. There's also one bad power-up, the eggplant, which makes your energy meter drain much more quickly. Knowing that this was a Hudson Soft game and seeing how many fond memories people seem to have of it, I was expecting a fun, if somewhat oddball, treat. Hudson Soft did make my favorite NES game, Felix the Cat, and they've also made a bunch of the Mario Party games, so I also wasn't expecting that much of a challenge. However, when I started playing Adventure Island, I found that this game is hard. Really hard. Why is it so hard? Well, you get killed in one hit, unless you have a skateboard, then you can take two. You get three lives, and when they're gone, you're done. Game over. And there are 32 levels to get through. You can gain extra lives at certain point levels, but they don't come often. Adventure Island represents a style of game that I'm not a big fan of. In order to have any chance of beating the game, you need to know its secrets. The biggest secret being the Hudson B at the end of the first level. You need to find this, as well as enter a code, in order to be able to continue your game. Without this, or abusing save states on something like a virtual console, I have no idea how the average gamer would come close to completing this game. The game also features a secret weapon, which has a much greater range than the axes and can destroy items like rocks and boulders. This makes the gameplay considerably easier. However, these aren't easy to find, as they usually appear in eggs that spawn as you jump away from them and quickly disappear off the screen. In order to find these secret power-up eggs, you need to take your time so you don't run past them. However, with a constantly depleting energy meter, taking your time doesn't feel very natural at all. 
Plus, to make it worse, unlike the Hudson Bee, this much more powerful weapon isn't even mentioned in the manual. When playing this for the first time, I didn't even discover one until quite a few levels in. And of course, if you die, it disappears. Again, this is something I don't really enjoy. You need to have either looked up these secrets or learned them for yourself by playing the levels over and over again in order to get the most out of the game. Going into it blind for the first time was actually a pretty frustrating experience. I think this kind of gameplay might have been more enjoyable as a child, but now as an adult with a limited amount of time on my hands, I really don't have the desire to play the starting levels over and over and over until I learn all the secrets the game has to offer. The game gets quite repetitive as each of the eight worlds repeat the same four or five level designs over and over, just adding more difficulty and requiring quicker reflexes. There's a land level, a water level, a forest level, some kind of cave, and occasionally an ice level. Each type of level also reuses the same types of enemies. There's a boss fight at the end of each world, and strangely, these boss fights are the least challenging parts of the game. Also, each individual boss fight is exactly the same. So, Adventure Island was not my cup of tea. Though the core gameplay is solid, it just relies too much on secrets and memorizing all the tricky bits of the levels in order to progress. Honestly, did anyone actually beat this game when they were a kid? But if you are looking for a challenge, you can pick up an Adventure Car Island cart for about $10. Uh, though this game wasn't for me, I've heard lots of good things about the later games in the series, so I'll probably try those out at some point. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played one of the most rare licensed titles on the NES. It was one of the last releases for the system, and as well it was apparently a blockbuster rental exclusive, making it very difficult to find now. It's the Flintstones Surprise at Dino Peak. Surprise at Dino Peak was developed by Taito and released for NES in 1994, well after the release of the Super Nintendo console. It's a side-scrolling platformer that allows you to play as both Fred and Barney, who are out to find Pebbles and Bam Bam who have wandered off. This game evokes the spirit of the Flintstones cartoon splendidly. The visuals and sounds are all on point, and the characterization is exactly like it was in the show. From a collector's standpoint, Surprise at Dino Peak is the jewel of the collection. However, my expectations for it weren't very high. I was afraid it was going to be one of those games that cost a stupid amount of money, but no one actually wanted to play it. Luckily, I was pleasantly surprised. Allowing you to switch freely between Fred and Barney is one of the things that makes Dino Peak interesting. Fred is a strong melee attack and can grapple up ledges, while Barney has a weaker ranged attack and can hang from vines. In addition to the normal attacks, there are also some power-up weapons like a stone hammer and a bowling ball. You go through the game facing enemies and platforming challenges. For the platforming, it's mostly just a matter of choosing the correct character to use, while the combat allows you to choose which character suits your playstyle best. Do you want to be Barney and be safe at range but have the fight take longer, or do you want to be Fred and get a right up close and swing away?
for me, the best part of this game is the variety. It's not a long game, but they manage to pack in a lot of different things. First, having two different characters to play means you can personalize your gameplay a little bit. Also, the levels are all very different, giving you a number of different environments to explore. Some levels put the focus on Barney's climbing ability. While in others, it's Fred's ability to bash things in the head and grappling that will get you through it. Some bosses move around a lot and favor being able to be attacked at range. While for others, it's best to get right up close. To break up the land and climbing levels, there's also a surfing level that I thought was a lot of fun. You get to fly on a pterodactyl as you approach the end of the game. And then there's my personal favorite, the minecart level. Minecarts are a thing I tend to like in any game that uses them. The game also has a couple sports minigames, one is hockey, one is basketball, though I didn't find these particularly fun or interesting, though that may be because I always lost. The difficulty of Dino Peak fluctuates. While I found that 90% of the game wasn't overly challenging, there were a couple platforming sections that were quite unforgiving and really punished you for even a split second delay. The levels in this game do not have timers, so you can take the game at a pretty leisurely pace. Health pickups and power-ups are quite abundant, making most levels fairly forgiving of the odd mistake. There's also ample opportunity to collect stars for extra lives, and you only need enough of them to spell out yabba dabba do to do this. However, there are a few times in the game where you need to make like Indiana Jones and run away from boulders. Here, the game gets really tough and its leisurely pace disappears. If the boulder hits you, you get one shot, and the timing is not forgiving. One specific sequence where you had to climb away from the boulder as Barney was particularly brutal as I died over and over again. These challenging parts weren't completely unwelcome, but felt at odds with the game's otherwise relaxed pace. Surprise that Dino Peak isn't a very long game, it'll probably take you about an hour. However, it is a lot of fun, it looks and sounds good, and it really plays up the atmosphere and the sight gags of the Flintstones cartoon. Also, I really like the fact that it has two playable characters, which makes the gameplay a little bit more interesting than a lot of other platformers. If you're looking to pick up a copy of Dino Peak, the cart currently price charts for $700. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. A few weeks back I put the next game I'd review up to a vote on Twitter. Adventure Island is the thing that ended up winning, but I secretly wanted another one to emerge victorious. That game? The Guardian Legend. The Guardian Legend was developed by Compile and released for the NES in 1989. The game deftly combines two genres, creating a hybrid of a shoot 'em up and a top down action adventure. As the story goes, Naju, a world teeming with evil life forms, is hurtling towards the Earth, and you play the lone guardian who has to stop it. 
This is my ninth NES review and the first one that features a female protagonist. And not only is she a woman, she's an aerobot transformer who can switch between her human form and that of a fighter craft. Awesome! Now unfortunately, the Guardian legend hides behind some pretty generic artwork on the box and cartridge, but don't let that fool you, because inside, there's a pretty great game. The game is split into two distinct areas. There's the Labyrinth, a series of rooms and passages where you take on your human form, fight monsters, and gather items. There's an in-game map that'll tell you where you are and where you should be going, at least once you learn to read it. As you open up new areas, the map gets bigger. In addition to the starting area, there are another 10 zones to open up. As you can see, the game is very large. The other part of the game is the corridors. This is where the shoot 'em up part of the game comes in. Here you change into your fighter craft form and go through a fairly lengthy vertical corridor. Each corridor is filled with many different types of enemies, and each one ends in a boss fight. Sections of each corridor range from fairly relaxed to quite hectic to outright devious. When you defeat most of the end bosses, you get a key, which will open up a new area of the labyrinth. The game introduces a bit of a puzzle element when it comes to opening some of the corridors. Scattered throughout the labyrinth are clues for how to open them. Some are interesting, like having to shoot at a specific thing in the room, but a lot don't really add anything to the game. Most annoying of the bunch was the one where you had to enter and exit the corridor room repeatedly until it decided to open. For an NES game, the Guardian Legend is surprisingly complex. There are a ton of different weapons and stats to be leveled up, and item drops that come from killing monsters. At first it was a little bit overwhelming, but once I got used to it, it became an aspect of the gameplay that I really enjoyed. There are a ton of weapons, most of which can be used in both the labyrinth and the corridors. My favorites are the fireball, which slowly shoots ahead of you, damaging anything in its path. The bullet shield, which circles around you, damaging anything that comes close. And the repeller, which fires ahead of you and moves in large circles, taking out a big portion of the field. There are also weapons like Backfire and the Cutter Laser, which allow you to attack behind and to the sides of you, which opens up new strategies, especially for boss fights. And then there's the Enemy Eraser, which... kinda speaks for itself. These special weapons can be found in the Labyrinth, usually from mini-bosses, and can be leveled up to a third level. Special weapons are powered by power chips, and you can find red and blue chips all over the place in order to replenish them. The most important items are red and blue landers. These usually come from mini bosses or from corridor bosses and will increase your maximum health or power chips. This game is not linear. You can skip portions of the labyrinth and go right to a number of the corridors, but this would be a mistake since you'd miss a lot of these power-ups. You can even buy them from a few shops scattered around the labyrinth. The difficulty of the game is a bit uneven. I generally found the corridors pretty easy. I used my special weapons liberally, and a well-placed fireball could easily take out most enemies on screen. The corridors, on the other hand, were much harder. Enemies were numerous and sometimes hard to see against busy backgrounds. I found that it wasn't possible to avoid getting hit at all, so instead I generally tried to minimize my hits while making sure I picked up every health pickup that dropped for me. Strangely, I found the game got easier as it went. My character got powered up so much over the course of the game, and the extra health and power seemed to outpace the advancement of my enemies. The game offers a lot of different environments and enemy types. Though bosses do get repeated a couple times each, there are a lot of them, and each requires a different strategy. Some are quite straightforward and can be done with minimal movement, while others require a lot of bobbing and weaving. 
the huge selection of weapons allows for multiple viable strategies for each boss. As you can probably tell by the majority of the footage I chose for this video, I did find the corridors to be the most interesting part of the game. The last level of the game is a boss rush stage, where you fight each of the bosses you had fought before, one right after another. Then just when you think it's over, you come up against the final boss, which is something completely new. I really enjoyed The Guardian Legend. It's not a perfect game, but its hybrid nature and myriad of ways of powering up your character made it a lot of fun to play. I also really like that I could tailor the game to my personal preferences by choosing which weapon suited me best in each situation. The game is long, maybe even a little too long, easily taking me over 6 hours to beat. If you want to pick up a copy yourself, it's a common game, so it should only cost you 10 or $15. I think this is a steal, and I highly recommend it. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played another popular license game based on a cartoon. It's Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Chippendale Rescue Rangers was developed by Capcom and released for the NES in 1990. It's a platformer that allows you to play as either Chip or Dale, who are looking for a missing kitten. But, the missing kitten is just a decoy that allows Fat Cat to capture Gadget and force her to work for him so he can take over the city. I'm starting to get tired of rescuing ladies. I think I need to pick better games. Rescue Rangers is a fairly straightforward platformer. You run, you jump, you dodge enemies. The chipmunks don't have weapons per se, and instead defeat enemies by throwing found objects such as boxes or apples at enemies. Or, most enemies can just be avoided. There are also environmental dangers like electrical wires or water. You can get hit three times before you lose a life, though you can regain health by picking up acorns, and there are a limited amount of continues. There are also a couple ways to get extra lives, by collecting certain amounts of stars or flowers. Though I find the visuals in this game sort of mediocre, if you were ever a fan of the cartoon, the soundtrack should put a smile on your face. There's no case too big, no case too small, when you need help, just call ch 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 chip and dales There are a total of 11 levels in the game, though you only need to do 8 of them to get to the end. Each level wants to remind you that you're a tiny little chipmunk. Whether it's putting you against a backdrop of stacks of coins, or having you scurry over desks, the levels keep with the themes of the cartoon. There's only one real power-up in the game. If you find Zipper, he'll fly ahead and make you temporarily invulnerable. There's not a whole lot of variation in the gameplay. You run through levels, you pick up objects and throw them. Later levels add some new things. Conveyor belts and fans that impact your speed. Switches and taps you need to turn on and off to proceed. Enemies run the gamut from dogs to lizards and trilby hats to projectile-toting weasels. Each level ends with a boss fight, and though the appearance of the bosses are varied, the way you beat them stays the same. There's also a small bonus round after each level where you can pick up some extra flowers and stars. The game also offers a co-op mode. Here's a tip. Don't play this co-op with anyone you want to remain friends with. 
My boyfriend and I tried it, and it was not our finest hour. We ended up taking turns playing the single player rather than play the co-op for the sake of our relationship. The biggest problem with co-op? Friendly fire. There's collision between the two characters. You can pick up the other player, throw them. If you throw an object and they get in the way, they get stunned. You can screw up jumps by running into each other. For a game that's quite fun and easy on single player, the co-op experience seems way off base. Co-op makes the game harder and much more frustrating. Yes, this is me literally being carried through a level. Though I found the co-op experience slightly misguided, for the most part, Rescue Rangers is a fun, if simple, game. It's very short, especially if you're skipping levels, and you should be able to beat it in under an hour. Uh, now this one is not too rare. If you want to pick up a cart, you can probably get it for $10 or $15. Uh, there is also a Rescue Rangers 2, which came out much later in the console's life cycle, and this one is a lot more rare and expensive, though the gameplay is pretty much the same. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played a game requested by a viewer. I've been playing a lot of platformers lately and was looking for something a little different, so I went with Doug E's request, Breakthrough. Breakthrough was developed by Data East and was originally an arcade game. It was released for the NES in 1987. It's a vehicular combat game, and the story, which is told entirely through text, tasks you with breaking through enemy lines in order to retrieve a stolen fighter plane. As you go through the game's five levels, you'll be attacked by a number of different enemies. Soldiers, landmines, turrets, and other vehicles. There are also environmental dangers to avoid, like water and falling rocks, or broken roads. The one-hit kills in Breakthrough make it abundantly clear that this was originally an arcade game, meant to take as many of your quarters as possible. This does make deaths quite frustrating, as they happen a lot and often feel unavoidable the first time you see them. Luckily, you get three lives and there's a decent checkpoint system in place within each level. There are also unlimited continues. Your basic weapon isn't great, firing single bullets straight ahead of you. Occasionally, power barrels fall from the sky, and if you manage to catch one, you'll be a force to be reckoned with. These give you three-way shooting for 15 or 30 seconds, or until you lose a life. The game gets a lot easier when you have a better weapon. But when I didn't have the power up, I found I survived much better by jumping over enemies rather than trying to take them out. One thing that doesn't translate well from arcades to consoles, for me at least, is scores. I totally get wanting to get a high score in an actual arcade and see your initials displayed up on the screen, but in terms of doing it at home, points aren't much of an incentive, so I had no problem just jumping over everything that came at me. This was a fairly early game on the NES, so the visuals and music, while passable, are nothing to write home about. The controls are pretty solid, though. This game is extremely short. There are only five levels, each of which is only a few minutes long. Of course, deaths extend the playtime considerably, but if you have a good run, you could finish it in 10 minutes. So what did I think of Breakthrough? It was all right. It's definitely not one of the best games on the console, but it's far from the worst. I like short arcade style games, and it was nice to play something a little different. If you're looking to pick up a copy of Breakthrough for yourself, it's not an expensive one. It sells for about $5.
Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week I played one of the NES games I spent a lot of time with as a kid and have some really good memories of. It's Disney's Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. Adventures in the Magic Kingdom was developed by Capcom and released for the NES in 1990. The Disney parade is about to begin, but Goofy has lost the keys to the castle. Silly Goofy. You need to find six silver keys to open the gate and let the parade begin. This game does have its faults, and I'll get to those, but my favorite thing about it is that it doesn't stick to a single genre. There are vehicle stages, platforming levels, quick time events, and even some Disney trivia. You play as a rather generic little boy who looks like he's going on a safari. I've named him Pam, which may make life tough for him outside of the Magic Kingdom. As you're given free reign of the park, you can approach the six activities you need to do in any order you'd like. There are two platforming levels. The better one is the Haunted Mansion. As you go through the mansion, you'll encounter ghostly apparitions, which you can fight by throwing candles, and a lot of platforming jumping in the second half. It's not the most challenging of levels, but it controls well and the music and visuals are really on point. I've been to Disney World in Florida once when I was pretty little. I remember my mom and I going on the Haunted Mansion over and over again. It's not much of a ride per se, but it is a cool spooky experience that makes great use of optics. Plus there was never any lineup. So this level in particular brings back a lot of good memories. The other platforming level is Pirates of the Caribbean, and this one doesn't hold up quite as well as the Haunted Mansion. In this one, enemies must be avoided rather than fought, and your character's speed and jumping ability just don't seem up to snuff. In addition to getting through unscathed, you must also locate and rescue six villagers who have been kidnapped by the pirates. This level can also be a bit frustrating in that you need to find a candle to light the signal fire to end the level, and it's not the most intuitive to find. The trivia portion of the game can be a bit obscure. While there were some questions I could answer easily, a number of them were about Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 30s or 40s that I just had to guess at. There's a big Thunder Mountain level where you have to direct a train car down the correct path and avoid obstacles. It's a very quick level if you do it correctly, though one wrong or slow move can easily send you into a dead end. The Autopia Racing level is probably my least favorite of the bunch. In this level, you need to race someone for the key, though you're really racing the clock as opposed to the other cars on the track, who mostly seem to be there to get in your way. The controls for this are a bit stiff, and so much as brushing an obstacle or wall will bring you to a dead stop, which is a real momentum killer. My favorite level in the game is Space Mountain, and this is another one that I have really good memories of. It was the only roller coaster in the park, at least back when I was there, and having it be completely in the dark, surrounded only by twinkling starlights, made for an exciting ride where you never really knew where you were going. This level represents Space Mountain well. The aesthetic is the same, and the game makes use of quick time events, though I'm not sure if they were called that in 1990, to navigate through space and let you bob and weave around asteroids and shoot at other ships. In the later parts of the level, the prompts come up very quickly, mimicking the fast twists and turns of the roller coaster. The first person perspective makes it feel like you're flying a spaceship. The visuals and sounds are really top notch. Everything is colorful, the overworld map looks good and represents Disney World or land fairly well. Every level has its own distinct look along with its own musical theme. And the music is quite catchy.
This is not the most challenging of games, and to make things even easier, you can cash in the stars you collect through the levels on the pause screen for bonuses like extra health, temporary invincibility, or the ability to freeze your enemies. The number of different genres represented in this game is the best part of it for me. But, though there's variety in the levels, there's really only five of them, plus the trivia, and they're over quickly. The quality of the controls varies from level to level, though overall they're pretty solid, and the visuals and music are top notch. However, I can't help but wish that there was just a few more levels in the game to help round it out a bit. If you're looking to pick up a copy of Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, it's not a very expensive one, and you should be able to get it for under $10. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. This week, I played a classic shoot 'em up on the NES for the first time. Based on the cover art, it's a game about fighting killer carrots. It's Gun Neck. Gun Neck was developed by Compile and released for the NES in 1991. It's a scrolling vertical shooter that puts you in control of Commander Gun Neck. Inanimate objects like animals, plants, and products have been springing to life and attacking people. It's up to you to find the source of this problem and defeat it. My first impression of this game was that it looks a lot like the spaceship shooter portions of The Guardian Legend, another game I love, and this sort of makes sense considering they have the same developer. However, though a number of the visuals and even sound effects are almost identical, the gameplay mechanics themselves are different enough that it doesn't just feel like a copy. Gunnack is a classic vertical spaceship shooter, with a few twists. There are five different weapons you'll have access to throughout the game. Each comes from a floating power-up block labeled with a number. Picking up the same number you already have will power up your current weapon, while picking up a new number will change your weapon. From your basic straight-ahead stream of bullets, to beams of fire, to a triple laser, the weapons all play differently and have their own strengths and weaknesses. The power-ups make a noticeable difference by changing your bullet stream to a spread shot, making your projectiles larger, or giving you the ability to shoot out to the sides. Weapon number three is a smart weapon that auto-targets your enemies, and it's as close to an easy mode as Gun Neck is going to offer you. Besides the weapon power-ups, there are also four different kinds of bombs you can pick up, differentiated by different letters. As with the weapons, picking up the same bomb will make it more powerful, while picking up a different one will change which one you have equipped. The different bombs also feel quite different. W literally rains havoc down on the whole screen, while F is more contained damage, but it lasts longer. While bombs are always useful, I find them especially good against the bosses. However, when you deploy a bomb, your weapon temporarily switches back to the weakest one and power-ups are disabled. This can leave you vulnerable. Besides the weapons and bombs, there are a number of other pickups. Small power-up chips power up your current weapon no matter which one it is. The enemy eraser will kill everything on screen. And picking up a wing will give you armor and allow you to take two hits instead of the usual one before losing a life. A ship pickup will give you an extra life, plus armor if you need it. And little blue and yellow helpers, another visual taken straight from the Guardian legend, will give you random objects if you touch them. Between areas, there's a shop where you can spend the money you've collected. Here you can buy weapon power-ups or wings, bombs for upcoming levels, or turbo power. Turbo power wasn't really explained, but it seemed like a good thing to max out. I think it increased the rate of fire, but I'm not 100% on that. There are eight areas in total, and each is a decent length. 
All of them feature a midpoint boss along with an end boss. Generally, I found the bosses easier than the rest of the levels, especially if I had a lot of bombs stored up. The visuals are impressive, and the music is both fun and catchy. Each area has a completely different look and different types of enemies. The first area features killer bunnies and attacking carrots, while in another you're being attacked by plants, wood, and paper products. In the fifth area, you're being attacked by gold bars and coins in a bank. There are definitely some unique ideas in this game. The idea of the products we consume every day rising up and attacking us is a little alarming. Perhaps Gunnack is a warning about the dangers of consumer culture or the damage we're doing to our environment. Maybe it's a takedown of the evils of capitalism. Or maybe it's just weird. The game doesn't start out too challenging, and the first few areas do a good job at easing you into the game. By the halfway mark, things get a bit tough. There are more enemies on screen and their movements become more unpredictable. By the time you get to Area 7, where you have to bob and weave through heat flares from the sun, things get pretty intense. Luckily, there are unlimited continues, and you can get extra lives fairly frequently through score or pickups. I had a hard time finding fault with this game. Occasionally, it's hard to differentiate colorful flashing enemy projectiles from a sometimes similarly colored flashing background, though that's an issue most shmups run into at some point or another. Also, the manual kinda sucks. I didn't know until after I finished the game that I could press select to change the speed of my ship. Honestly, I'm kinda grasping at straws as far as criticism goes. Gunnack is a very solid, extremely fun game, which is unsurprising given the pedigree of its developers. It provides a good challenge, great controls and music, and interesting, slightly offbeat environments and enemies. I wholeheartedly recommend this one. Unfortunately, it is a rare game, so it's currently price charting around $150. However, if you can get your hands on it, whether it be the cartridge or some other way, I recommend it. It's worth your time. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. For this video, I went back to my Nintendo roots, but chose a game I've never played before. It's got detectives, danger, and dames. It's Deja Vu. Deja Vu was developed by Icom Simulations. It was originally released for Macintosh in 1985 and was ported to the NES in 1990. It's a point-and-click adventure game that puts you into the shoes of an unknown protagonist. You wake up in a bathroom stall with no idea of who you are or why you're there. The game has a good hook. A lot of NES games are short on story, so it's nice to play something where it gets to take center stage. As you explore your surroundings, you get clues to who you are and what's going on. In the bathroom stall, you find a gun in a trench coat, which sort of gives away your profession. You find keys and mysterious letters, some evidence about why your memory is gone, and even stumble on a dead body. Finding out who murdered this mystery man and making sure that you aren't the one who takes the fall for it becomes the central purpose of the game, in addition to recovering your lost memories, of course. I've always been a huge fan of point-and-click adventure games. It's one of the genres I grew up with. But I have to say, a console just isn't the ideal home for them. Without a mouse, the controls are way too clunky. The game interface is split into three areas. There's the game window in the top left where you can navigate and examine your location. 
The top right houses your inventory, and the bottom of the screen switches between displaying all dialogue and text and showing all possible commands. There's also a small map interface that will let you know the ways which you can move from the current screen. Using the D-pad to move your cursor is an exercise in frustration. Other than the poor controls, the gameplay is alright. It's full of puzzles, mostly inventory puzzles, and for the most part the solutions make sense. There's nothing overly challenging here. Though the inventory puzzles made sense, there was often a problem with just having way too much of it. At certain points in the game, I had five or six pages of items, and I had to flip through them every time I wanted to do something. It took a while. This isn't an action-heavy game. As with most adventure games, it's mostly about being observant and picking up everything. You are often in danger, though. You can come across muggers, assassins, or even some rather intricate traps. When in doubt, use your fists to talk your way out of trouble. As the game progresses, you slowly uncover more of the story, which includes murder, kidnapping, and a big setup. Unfortunately, you're the one being set up. The first half of the game has you trying to regain your memory, and once you've done that, the purpose switches to eliminating evidence against you and finding evidence against the real criminals so you don't take the fall. There's one sequence near the end of the game that's just dreadful. In order to get rid of any evidence that points to you as the culprit, you need to drop items from your inventory or burn them. This means going through every single item that could incriminate you one by one. This took me a good 10 minutes. It was really tedious. I also had a few moments of severe frustration at one point when I thought I had combined two items incorrectly and had gotten myself stuck. After a while, I realized that I wasn't stuck, I just had to use a totally unintuitive command in order to separate the items again. When I reached the end of Deja Vu, I was hauled off to jail. Apparently, I had missed some evidence, and the police thought that I was the guilty one. Now usually, I would take this opportunity to go back and find out what I had missed so that I could get the good ending, but in the case of Deja Vu, I just didn't feel much desire to continue playing. Getting the bad ending seemed preferable. Deja Vu isn't a long game. You could finish in under an hour if you're really good at finding everything the first time around. But if you miss things and have to backtrack, the playtime can go up considerably. So what else is there to say about Deja Vu? The music ranges from catchy to rather shrill and annoying. The graphics are alright, and there's some good detail in the environments, but the color palette seems to be made up almost entirely of browns and blues, so it's not all that interesting to look at. While I appreciate Deja Vu's focus on story, the NES is just not the ideal platform for it. What could be an enjoyable adventure game experience just gets bogged down with poor controls that make every command and interaction take much longer than it should. However, if you're looking to pick up a copy, it is a fairly common game, and you should be able to grab it for 10 bucks or so. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm going back to the NES and playing one of the games that I had as a kid. It was not one of my favorites then, but let's see how it holds up now. It's Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia was developed by Broderbund and originally released for the Apple II in 1989. It was ported to the NES by Virgin in 1992. 
The story isn't mentioned at all in-game, but from the manual, the wizard Jafar has seized power from the Sultan and forces the Sultan's daughter to marry him or die. The game's protagonist is thrown into the dungeon and has one hour to escape and rescue the princess. When you start out in the dungeon, you have nothing. No weapons, no real idea where to go, and one of the first things you need to do is find a sword so you can take on any of the guards who are scattered across the levels. I always found this game really difficult when I played as a kid, and I don't think I ever got past the first level or two. Playing it through now, I did get much further, but the game's shortcomings are still pretty hard to get past. The most glaring issue is the movement and controls. Moving using the D-pad results in your character taking great leaping strides, and when you let go of the button, he doesn't stop immediately. The platforming in this game requires a lot of precision, and the default movement is the opposite of precise. There's a second kind of movement, with B, that slows things right down. This can be used to slide past spikes without them hurting you, or to get to the edge of a platform in order to make a long jump. The jump controls are also a little weird and take some getting used to. Pressing A causes you to jump forward, even from a standstill. If you want to jump straight up, you have to press up on the D-pad, though there's also a little forward momentum to this. If you want to do a running jump, the manual instructs you that you need to back up at least two full strides from the edge you want to jump from. I've honestly never had such a problem performing a running jump in a game. It was maddening. Alright, run and jump. Let's try again. Run, jump! Run and jump. Have a good feeling about this one. Run, fall. I'm not new to platforming, I don't understand what it is about this control scheme that makes it so difficult to jump while running. The levels aren't very large, but they also aren't linear. There are dead ends, traps, and the exit door has to be unlocked by stepping on a pressure plate somewhere in the level. It can be frustrating to reach the exit and find you need to backtrack to find the plate that opens the door. There are 12 levels in the game and you have 60 minutes to get through them all, so 5 minutes a level. While the game certainly can be completed in that time, half that even, it does require some memorization as time can easily tick away as you have to backtrack or restart the level because the controls suck and you can't run and jump over a ledge. Prince of Persia is a game that got ported to a ton of different systems, and by all accounts, the NES port is not one of the better ones. It's not terribly surprising, given the limitations of the hardware, but most aspects of the game leave something to be desired, and the story bits which are featured in other versions are totally absent here. The game isn't just platforming, there's also some sword fighting required when you run into guards. This consists of attacking and blocking. For the most part, it was just a matter of spamming attack before your opponent has a chance to hit you. Outside of the gameplay, the game aesthetics don't add a whole lot. The music is repetitive and gets grating after a while. There is at least an option to turn it off. The sound effects are clunky, especially when you do things like run into walls, which you'll probably do quite a lot. Visually, things get very redundant. Though the character models look pretty good, the dungeon background gets boring real quick. There are purple dungeon levels, and orange dungeon levels. And that's about it. Overall, Prince of Persia on the NES is disappointing, and I didn't like it any more now than I did as a kid. The unresponsive controls are infuriating, and the movement is jarring and unprecise when you need the exact opposite to get through levels. It's not a game I'll be going back to anytime soon. If you're looking for a copy yourself, the cart does sell for about $15 loose, but I'd skip this one.
Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. I've been having a difficult time picking a new game to review. Because of the winter, I'm feeling a little unproductive and not really wanting to take on anything that would take a long time to play. So luckily I found a video from Brazzle the Gamer about five affordable hidden gems on the NES. Uh, if you don't already follow Brazzle, I would suggest you check out his channel. I'll include a link in the description below. Uh, one of the games he talked about was Legendary Wings. Legendary Wings was developed by Capcom. Originally made as an arcade game, it was released for the NES in 1988. It's a shoot 'em up that combines vertical and horizontal stages. The story? Well, there's not much of one. From the manual, Ares has given two young men courage and wings of love to save the human race from extinction. In the game, we're told that the devil awaits us in the palace, but mainly we just fight machines and the occasional dragon. The game has five levels, each of which is separated into two phases. First a vertical stage, followed by a horizontal. In the vertical stage, you have two different types of attacks. B is your main attack, which damages airborne enemies, while A fires missiles, which are the only way to take out some stationary hostiles. I didn't find it was always clear when enemies could only be taken out with missiles. During the horizontal stage, you use only your main attack. My first impression of the game wasn't that great, though I liked the visual style, it started off really difficult. The biggest issue I had was that there are no visual or audio cues to let you know that you're doing any damage to whatever you're attacking. Take these statues. They can take a lot of hits before you kill them, and when first encountering them, I had no idea if they even could be killed. Neither my main attacks or missiles seemed to be doing anything. However, after a few fast game overs, I realized the trick to this game. It's all about the power-ups. The game has five different power levels, and at the lowest of these levels, you may as well be wielding a pea shooter. If you get hit at this lowest level, you lose a life. The second weapon is a twin laser, which shoots two beams, but is still quite weak. Next comes penetration, which is the first weapon that didn't make me feel useless, then flame shots, which shoot projectiles in multiple directions. The final form is a firebird, which is very powerful and also allows you to take two hits rather than one before you get bumped down to the previous power level. The secret is to never lose your power-ups. When at full power, you can destroy projectiles heading for you. At low power, you can't kill much of anything quickly. An interesting thing about Legendary Wings is that the original arcade version had a male and a female protagonist. They were named and they had slightly different looking sprites. Now, later versions of this game were updated to have two male characters, and that's the version that Nintendo chose to use when they ported this to their system. When playing two-player mode, the sprites are the same and can only be differentiated between their differently colored booty shorts and thigh-high boots. However, I do quite enjoy the character models. I tried out two-player mode very briefly. While it was something I looked forward to, the abundance of objects on screen at the same time made for a tremendous amount of slowdown. It was almost unplayable, so we never got past the first level. While this was disappointing, the single-player game did end up being quite enjoyable. I really liked the combination of the two views, which added some variety to the gameplay, and the visuals in the game were colorful and unique. At the end of each half of the level, you face a boss. After the vertical part, it's a dragon, which dive bombs you and shoots fire. After the horizontal stages, it's some kind of machine that shoots eyeballs at you. Each iteration of the boss gets a little bit tougher, and as I mentioned before, if you go in at low power levels, it can take quite some time to defeat. 
The end boss of level one took me two and a half minutes to beat with the lowest power level. There are also a couple different types of hidden levels. Getting hit by this big face dude draws you into the danger zone and you have to do an extra horizontal stage. Notice how I can't kill anything with this gun. There's also a lucky level, which is hidden somewhere. If you destroy the right object, it will open up a portal, which takes you to another horizontal level. But this time, it's full of treasure that boosts your score, rather than things that are trying to kill you. Overall, Legendary Wings was fun enough, though not one of the best shoot 'em ups I've ever played. I did enjoy the visuals and the fact that you got to switch between the vertical and horizontal stages, but the five levels did get quite repetitive. It's not a very long game, providing that you can hang on to your power-ups, you should be able to beat it in less than an hour, and if you're looking for a copy for yourself, it's a cheap one and you should be able to find it for less than $10. Things are getting uncomfortably phallic. I think it's time to go. Yeah, I'm out. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm going to talk a bit about one of the most ubiquitous puzzle games, Tetris. As I'm sure most people know, Tetris is a game that's based on stacking and creating lines out of shapes called tetronomos. The game was first developed by Alexei Pajitnov in 1984, and though its enormous rise in success in 1989 is generally credited with it being bundled with the Game Boy, there were actually two versions available on the NES as well, though one of them wasn't available for very long. Tetris was first released for the NES by Atari under the brand Tengen in May of 1989. Unfortunately, while Atari had successfully obtained a license to produce Tetris in arcades, Nintendo had secured the sole license to develop it on consoles. Because of this, Tengen Tetris was ordered to be pulled off shelves only four weeks after release and unsold copies were destroyed. Only around 100,000 copies were sold. Because of this, Tengen Tetris became one of the first rare and collectible games on the NES, long before the system became a target for collectors. Though Tengen Tetris was pulled off shelves in June of 1989, Nintendo did not release a licensed version of the game for NES until November of that year. It was developed by Bulletproof Software, who also did the Game Boy version. Though the basic premise of the gameplay doesn't change, the Tengen and Atari versions do offer quite different experiences. The Nintendo licensed version of Tetris offers two game modes, cleverly named Type A and Type B. Type A is a marathon mode, while Type B lets you pick your level and the height of the random blocks that will start the level out, and the goal is just to get 25 lines. In Type A, you can choose your level at the start and you try to get as many lines as possible. As your level increases, blocks start dropping faster and faster and it gets much more challenging. The difficulty ramps up quite dramatically above level 8 or so. It's all going so well, then you make one little mistake, and it all comes tumbling down. The Tengen version on the other hand offers a lot more game modes and the option of including a second player. The regular one-player mode is very similar to Nintendo's Marathon mode, where you just play for as long as you can as blocks drop progressively faster. Two-player mode lets you compete with a friend to get the most lines. You each get the exact same order of block drops, so it never seems unfair. The first person to reach each 30-line threshold gets bonus points. This mode is a lot of fun, though if one person gets a game over, the other keeps going until they do as well. This could go on for some time and not be overly fun for the loser. Not that I ever experienced that. In cooperative mode, things get really hectic as both players share a board and two blocks drop at a time, with each player controlling one. Though it's supposed to be cooperative, lines are still tallied separately, which gives it a competitive edge. There are also modes that let you play versus or with the computer. 
Tengen Tetris clearly offers more options in regards to gameplay modes, and the addition of a co-op mode is a huge plus that gives a good reason to rank it as better than the licensed version. In terms of aesthetics though, the winner's not so clear cut. The aesthetics of both games have their positives and negatives, and while I like the different colored blocks in Tengen's Tetris, I do find the Nintendo version is a little bit more polished. The different shapes, though similarly colored, look shinier and more attractive. They also change color palette every level. In Tengen Tetris, the blocks see the same color throughout the levels, except when they land, they turn an ugly yellow color. I also feel like Nintendo's Tetris gives you a little bit more feedback. When you get a Tetris, which is clearing four lines at the same time, Tengen doesn't really acknowledge it, whereas in Nintendo's version, you at least get a screen flash. In Tengen Tetris, when you win a game in two-player mode, or get up to 30 levels in one-player mode, you're treated to some Russian dancers. That's nice. When you successfully complete Mode B in Nintendo's Tetris, or get a high score in Mode A, you're told that you are a Tetris master. I'm a Tetris master. Yes. Here are a few more fun facts about Tetris. Tengen was not the only one prevented from selling Tetris on console. A version was also developed for the Sega Mega Drive, but never reached shelves because of Nintendo's exclusive console rights. Tetris 2 was released on NES near the end of the console's life cycle. Though it added a two-player mode, it also completely changed the rules of the game and resembled Dr. Mario more than actual Tetris. Tetris's wide appeal is why it was ported to so many different platforms. When I was a kid I had my NES in my bedroom, and sometimes on weekends I'd wake up to find my mom in my room playing Tetris at low volume so that it wouldn't wake me up. It really is a game that appeals to everyone. Both versions of Tetris on the NES are based on the same solid gameplay, so they're both good games. However, though while I like the look of the Nintendo version more, I think the Tengen one is a bit better of a game just because of the variety of game modes that it offers. If you're looking to pick up a copy of either of these games, uh, you can get the licensed version of Tetris for pretty cheap. It sold really well, there's a lot of copies out there. If you want a copy of Tengen Tetris on the other hand, since so few were sold, you're looking at upwards of $50. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. I was on the CollectorCast podcast recently, and the topic of favorite Mega Man game came up. I didn't have a favorite Mega Man game to share because I've never really played Mega Man. I figured it was time to fill this gap in my gaming repertoire, so this week I played Mega Man 2. Mega Man 2 was developed by Capcom and released for the NES in 1989. Though the first Mega Man, released in 87, hadn't been a commercial hit, the developers went ahead with a sequel as a bit of a passion project. It's a platform game, though I found the jumping aspect, which usually defines platformers, wasn't as challenging or interesting as weapon choice and shooting, but I'll get to that in a bit. In the game, Mega Man is after Dr. Wily, who is in his fortress. Before he can get there, eight robot masters must be defeated. You can take on the robots in any order you want, and each is preceded by a short level before you get to the boss encounter. The thing about playing and reviewing a game which most people have already played and are very big fans of is that everyone has an opinion. When I asked which order I should tackle the bosses on on Twitter, I thought that fights might break out. I ended up 
up going for Metal Man first to get his severely overpowered Metal Blade, though I didn't end up abusing this weapon through my playthrough and actually just used the Mega Buster most of the time. The eight Robot Master levels are all fairly short, but they're all unique and themed after the boss at the end. Bubble Man's level is underwater, and the most difficult thing is avoiding spiky mines that line the walls. Woodman is, unsurprisingly, in a forest. When you complete the level and defeat the robot, you get its weapon. Each robot is weak to a particular weapon and invulnerable to another. Some of these make sense, like Woodman being weak to fire, but others aren't so intuitive. One thing I really liked about Mega Man is that you have energy meters. One for your health, if it gets depleted, you die, and one for your weapon. If that one runs out, you can no longer use that weapon. I much prefer the health meter method than being killed after only one or two hits. Items which refill your health and weapon energy can be found throughout levels and can also drop from vanquished foes. One thing that kind of surprised me, at least for the first eight robot stages, was how little precision was needed and how easy it was to brute force my way through the game. On normal difficulty, energy refilling items drop so often that it doesn't really matter how much you get hit. On Airman's level, for example, I soon learned I didn't have to avoid the drills rising out of platforms. I could just get hit, kill one of the endlessly spawning mobs, and have my health and weapon energy completely refilled. There are a number of areas where energy can be farmed like this. Likewise, a lot of the robot masters could be killed by just spam shooting the appropriate weapon, rather than trying to avoid their attacks. I assume this is not the case when playing on difficult. There are three special items you can get to help you travel through the map and build platforms for yourself. These items aren't explained at all in the game, so I went a long time without using them. Then my boyfriend came in the room and made fun of me for trying to jump on disappearing blocks to traverse a lava pit rather than just using item 2 to fly over it. It was my first time playing and I had no idea what item 2 did. Once you reach Wily's Fortress though, you're expected to have these items mastered. For a game that's generally classified as a platformer, the jumping parts are not the most challenging or interesting parts of the game. Not that I never fell to my death, but generally I found that part of the game quite easy. Perhaps it's because I'm awesome, or more likely, it's because the controls are super tight and responsive. Probably the best controls I've ever experienced on the NES. Where the difficulty comes in, especially near the end, is knowing what weapons are the best to use to defeat enemies and dodging attacks. I'd almost classify it more as a run and gun. In the last few levels of the game, there's a bit of puzzle solving. One of my favorite parts of the game involved destroying turrets with crash bombs. You only have enough energy to shoot so many times, so you need to figure out the order in which you need to shoot the turrets and the walls protecting some of them in order to get everything without running out of energy. It took a few tries before I decided I need to get a little more creative with my platform at the beginning. Likewise, right before you finally face Dr. Wily, you need to take on each of the Robot Masters again. Here you also need to be strategic and try not to waste weapon energy. If you waste your shots and end up with no energy for the final boss fights, you're out of luck. Thankfully, there are unlimited continues, so if you lose all your lives, you only have to restart from the beginning of the stage you're on. Another of my favorite parts of the game was in the Quick Man level, where I had to outrun Walls of Fire, making careful use of the charge for Time Stopper.
The only major complaint I have about Mega Man 2 is how you switch out your weapons and items. You have to pause the game, scroll through two pages of different weapons, and select the one you want to use. It's sort of slow and cumbersome, and because of this, I ended up using the default weapon quite a lot. Part of this isn't necessarily an issue with the game itself, as much as it's a limitation of the NES. There's only so many options when the controller has so few buttons. However, from a UI perspective, things like having the weapons listed on a single page, or listing their full names, would have made things a bit easier. As a newcomer to the series, I don't have the names of the bosses, weapons, and items memorized, so opening the menu just to see a bunch of letters or numbers to choose from isn't particularly helpful. Everything else about the game is pretty great, though. I can't talk about Mega Man without mentioning the music, which is amazing. Some of the best music on the NES for sure. Likewise, the visuals are good. There's a ton of variety in the level design, the types of enemies you face, and the attacks used by the robot masters. The game really never gets repetitive or boring. So I'm pretty sure everyone else already knows this, but Mega Man 2 is great. The gameplay is really fun, it's got a rockin' soundtrack, super tight controls, and even a little bit of puzzling. I'm glad I finally played this. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today my review is going to be a short one, because there's only so many things I can say about this game. It's Home Alone. Home Alone was developed by Bethesda Softworks and released for the NES in 1991. It's a... you know, I'm not quite sure what genre to classify it as. You mostly just do a lot of walking. I wanted to review this game because I thought that it was one of the ones that I played on NES as a kid. But, as it turns out, and this is not a surprise to me, I have bad memory. Like, the worst. I did not play Home Alone on NES. I played Home Alone on PC. But, while I'm playing it, let's take a look at this version. Alright, game starting up. Let's go in the house, pick up these light bulbs. Go in the kitchen. There's probably something useful in the kitchen. Oh, nope. Pick up this iron, maybe? Drop it. And I lost. What was that, like 10 seconds? The game has you traveling through the McAllister house as two bandits chase you. You pick up items like light bulbs, spiders, and irons with A, then drop them with B. If a bandit walks over them, they will be incapacitated for a time. You can carry three traps at once and switch between them with select. Some traps incapacitate for more time, but there's really no way to tell this until you use them. There's also an option to hide. And that is basically the whole game. This game is the definition of a lazy cash-in. Remember the great John Williams score in the Home Alone movie? Hope you do remember and you can hum it in your head because YouTube's not gonna let me play it here. Well, in this game, we have this. Or this. Stirring stuff. The visuals are similarly unimpressive. There's just one location, the graphics are very basic, and the character animations are a little janky. Controls, specifically around going up and down staircases, are sluggish and somewhat unresponsive, meaning I got caught by the bandits a lot of times when I really shouldn't have. And how do you finish the game? 
Well, if you run around without getting caught for 20 minutes, the game unceremoniously ends and you get a screen that shows the police taking the wet bandits away. And that's it. Home Alone on NES is a bad game. The controls are often unresponsive, it's nothing special to look at, and the gameplay is as repetitive as it gets. Kevin may have made his family disappear, but I wish I could make this game disappear. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today's review was a request by longtime viewer and commenter Lord JS. It's Gunsmoke on NES. Gunsmoke was developed by Capcom. Originally created as an arcade game in 1985, it was ported to the NES in 1988. The game is a vertical scrolling shooter that takes place in the Wild West. You play Billy Bob, a bounty hunter and cowboy who's out to rid the town of Hicksville of its outlaws. Through each of the game's six levels, you'll face a bevy of enemies and eventually face off against the outlaw you are hunting. Though at first glance, Gunsmoke may seem like any other non-space shoot-'em-up, there are a couple different mechanics that make it unique. The first is the shooting itself. Rather than only being able to shoot straight in front of you, you can shoot in three directions. B shoots to the left, A to the right, while holding A and B together makes you shoot straight. I enjoyed this extra bit of control, though pushing A and B at once did make my hand get sore rather quickly. There are also multiple weapons in the game. Your default weapons are dual pistols, which have unlimited ammo. You can buy other weapons from shops with the points you collect by playing the game. There's a shotgun, which fires a spread shot a machine gun, which fires like your pistols but at a much higher rate, and a magnum, which is slower but a lot stronger. You'll only get the ammo for these if you already own the gun, which you lose if you die. There are also a number of other items you can pick up from downed enemies. Cowboy boots will increase your speed, and rifles will increase the range of your weapons. Cattle skulls will take away your speed and range boost, though. POW symbols instantly kill any enemies on screen. The horse, which can also be bought in shops, allows you to take a few more hits before losing a life. I think I could have taken much more advantage of the horse during my playthrough. I only ended up getting on it once when I found it in the first level. There are also Yashishi symbols, which are common to Capcom games. Blue makes you temporarily invincible, while red gives you an extra life. Another unique thing about Gunsmoke is its use of wanted posters. The end boss of each level won't appear until you obtain it, and it's not easy to find. The wanted posters are hidden and totally invisible until you shoot them multiple times. The only way of knowing where it is, is by the sound. Shooting at the location of the wanted poster makes the same sound as shooting a barrel. When getting swarmed by enemies, I found it tough to keep an ear out for this. I only ended up finding the wanted poster in about half the levels. If you don't find the wanted poster, the level will continue forever. Thankfully, you can also purchase it. It's not cheap, but you do what you need to do to get to the end of the stage. The game has a good difficulty curve. It starts out not too challenging, but I found each level got harder by introducing more enemies, allowing them to shoot in different directions, and changing the level design so you had less of a clear path through and room for movement. There was one way of increasing difficulty that I wasn't a fan of. In later levels, enemies start appearing on screen from behind you. Since you can't shoot backwards, they were a pain in the butt. The one exception to the smooth difficulty curve is the bosses. Though the first boss was kind of a pushover, it was the second boss, Cutter, who throws boomerangs at you, that I found to be the most difficult in the entire game. 
There are six levels and six bosses in total. The bosses don't appear alone, the regular enemies will appear in varying numbers as well. Bandit Bill is the first boss. He'll fire a single stream of bullets at you, which isn't too hard to avoid. He'll drop to the ground and become invulnerable after taking a hit, but it's just a matter of waiting for him to get back up. The difficulty with the second boss, Cutter, comes from the unpredictability of his boomerangs. They don't travel in a smooth arc, they kind of go all over the place, and it's easy to be taken by surprise, especially with his minions shooting at you and dropping bombs that explode after a few seconds as well. As I mentioned, Cutter was the most challenging boss for me, though later bosses increase the difficulty by using weapons that shoot in multiple directions, like your shotgun, have higher health, disappear and reappear, or even have to be defeated twice. Gunsmoke isn't the most visually appealing game. The color palette is quite harsh with a lot of overly vibrant oranges, greens, and reds, and the animations are quite simple. There's a fair amount of variety in the levels though, with typical Wild West areas like towns, deserts, forests, and graveyards. Enemies are also your typical Western fare. Cowboys, Indians, ninjas, ninjas? All right, just go with it. Overall, Gunsmoke was a lot of fun to play. Though I found the wanted posters to be a bit of an odd decision that really just served to artificially lengthen the game, I did find the gameplay, the shooting mechanics, and the variety of weapons made for a very enjoyable time. If you like shoot 'em ups but want a break from spaceships, give Gunsmoke a try. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today my review is on one of August's community playthroughs over at RF Generation. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, it's Jaws. Jaws was developed by Westone Bit Entertainment and published by the much criticized LJN. It was released for the NES in 1987. The game is essentially a non-scrolling horizontal shooter, though there are a couple other mechanics thrown in. The Jaws game is loosely based on the movie. But not the critically acclaimed first movie. Not even the second one. It's based on the fourth and final movie, Jaws the Revenge. The goal of the game, as you can probably guess, is to defeat Jaws. You start out in a boat where you travel around until you randomly run into something in the water, or not so randomly run into Jaws protruding dorsal fin. Once this happens, you get taken to an underwater screen, where you slaughter all the lifeforms you can. Jellyfish, stingrays, and small sharks will swim across the screen, and you shoot at them with your endless harpoons. Each kill can drop items, such as crabs which speed you up, or shells which act as the main resource of the game. You use these shells at the ports located on the overworld map. Your first five will be used to buy a receiver, which lets you know how close Jaws is by how fast it beeps. The next 100 plus shells will be used to buy power-ups, which will make it easier to kill Jaws. However, you can't just collect a bunch of shells, go to a port, and buy as many power-ups as you can. Instead, you have to constantly travel between them, buying from one, then the other. This gets very tedious. This brings me to my biggest complaint about the game, the lack of variety. 90% of your game time is going to be spent on one of only three different screens. There's the overworld map where you pilot your boat, then two screens where combat takes place, one in deep water and one in shallow. The shallow environment ends up being a little tougher since there's less room to move around, but otherwise they're pretty much the same, and each features the same few kinds of enemies. There is also a bonus stage where you bomb jellyfish from an airplane. Talk about overkill. You get bonus shells based on how many you hit in your limited number of passes. Aside from the lack of variety, the game looks alright visually. I found the models and animation of the enemy sea life the most impressive, and the overall map is colorful and well defined. 
Musically, I wish we got more of that classic Jaws theme. There's a hint of it in the opening title screen, but the in-game music is a bit generic, and the shooting sound effects get a little grating after a while. The game does have a good difficulty curve. While it starts out quite easy, it does get more challenging as you get more powerful. Enemies get faster and will start aiming for you rather than just swimming along a set path. Jellyfish in particular went from very easy to being obviously out to get me. Another source of difficulty is your speed. Though picking up crab shells and getting a speed increase seems like a bonus, if you get too fast, your character becomes harder to control. There's some definite sliding that happens. Apparently, drag is not a thing in this ocean. The biggest difficulty is that you only get one life. Take a single hit from anything and you die. You do get three continues, but when you use one, you lose half your collected shells and a power level. This seems unnecessarily punishing. There is one way to avoid the one-hit deaths, and it comes in the form of a mini-sub. Though I never saw the mini-sub in my playthrough, here's a sample of it from World of Long Plays. The mini-sub will let you take one extra hit before you die, as well as drop bombs in addition to your regular forward shots. If you happen to run into Jaws before you've purchased enough power-ups, you may as well be firing at him with a pea shooter. Attacks are ineffective and he'll leave and heal back before you can make a dent in his health. Once you think you've purchased enough power-ups, I went up to power level 8. It's time to take on Jaws. The fight is on the longer side, but the combat is the same as the rest of the game. Get him down to zero health and he dies. Oh, wait, he came back. Of course he comes back. There's a second phase to the fight that puts you in a totally different viewpoint. Here you must use a strobe to get Jaws to surface out of the water, then spear him with the front of your boat. The objective here wasn't particularly clear. Some people seem to have an issue with the end of the game. You're presented with an end screen of a sunset. Personally, I find this to be the least of its issues. An unceremonious game over screen isn't something terribly unique to Jaws, and is seen in a number of other NES games. Jaws is not a great game. Though it's a competent enough shooter in very small doses, by the time you've had two or three random combat encounters, everything gets quite repetitive, and the main mechanic of driving back and forth between ports in order to power yourself up just isn't a very engaging one. I would give Jaws a pass. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. The game I'm reviewing today made me a master of blasting. It's Blaster Master, which I always want to call Master Blaster, but that's not right. Blaster Master. Blaster Master was developed by Sunsoft and released for the NES in 1988. It combines vehicle-based platforming and shooting with overhead action. During the platforming sections, you drive around in a tank, which can jump and shoot its cannon in multiple directions to take out enemies. There are also three special weapons that can be used. There's a homing missile, which seeks out targets, thunder break, which shoots lightning below you, and multi-warhead missile, which shoots three missiles at a time. You have to find ammo for these special weapons in order to use them. The platforming levels are not straight side-scrollers. Areas are often huge and include multiple levels and different surfaces like underwater areas. Figuring out where you need to go is one of the challenges in the game. You can press select to make your character exit the vehicle, though this is generally not a good idea since he's pretty weak and it's mostly just used to enter dungeons. When you do go into a dungeon, the top-down action starts. Much like the platforming sections, the dungeon can be rather large and maze-like. Some dungeons feature a boss, while others are only filled with minor enemies and power-ups. You can defeat enemies using your basic gun attack or by throwing shorter range grenades. Your gun can be made more powerful by picking up gun capsules. So, what's the story in Blaster Master? I'm glad you asked, Pam. It all starts with a guy named Jason, and Jason has a pet frog. What's the frog's name? Fred. That's a good name for a frog. One day, Fred escapes. Oh no! 
Oh yes. Jason, who loves his pet frog, gives chase, only to watch Fred run into a radioactive chest, grow to an enormous size, and then fall into a hole. Okay. Jason follows Fred into the hole and finds himself next to an armored vehicle called Sophia, which he must use to defeat the plutonium boss. <laughs> who? The plutonium boss, leader of the mutants that live under the Earth's crust. What? What mutants? Where did they come from? What does this have to do with Fred? The story doesn't make any sense. You don't make any sense. Despite the overall incomprehensiveness of the story, the opening intro is pretty cool and is accompanied by some great music. In fact, the music overall is pretty great, with some really catchy tunes that change from stage to stage. The game looks good as well. The environments are varied and colorful, and the sprites for both Sophia the Tank and Jason in overhead levels are quite detailed. Initially, the game was a bit confusing. Since the maps are so large, it's not easy to know where you're supposed to go. The game manual does include maps, which makes sense after you look at them for a while. But without them, getting to the dungeons you need to find isn't easy, especially since there are extra dungeons that don't include bosses. I love that this game combines the playstyles of two different genres. However, for me, one of them was a lot more fun than the other. The platforming and tank combat is the best part of this game. It's adequately challenging and gives you a lot of options between the ability to fire in multiple directions and the three special weapons. The levels are well designed and your tank learns new abilities as the game goes on to spice things up a little bit. One of the first things you get is the Crusher, which allows you to destroy some types of walls, opening up new areas. The ability to hover, which you get from the Stage 3 boss, lets your tank fly up to previously unreachable heights. This is a particularly enjoyable upgrade, though I often found myself wasting my hover fuel by double tapping A when I didn't need to. The later upgrades give you the ability to climb walls and ceilings, which sounds good, but is actually kind of annoying as it makes your tank stick to every surface. I had to relearn how to control it in order to get where I wanted to go, and ended up falling into a lot of death pits. At times you will find doorways that your tank is too large to get through. This is where you exit it and go on foot, starting the overhead action part of the game. These portions were a little confusing at first. Some of the dungeons are just full of blocks. I became a master of blasting inanimate blocks. Some of these will reveal power-ups, either health, hover, special ammo, or weapon power. Somewhat oddly, if you pause the game, all the blasted blocks will come back, though the power-ups will not. Though they will if you leave the dungeon and then go back in. Power-ups take your gun from an ineffective pea shooter with a very short range to a devastating multi-shot that cuts a swath through half the screen and causes explosions. However, the game does a really cruel thing. When you take damage as Jason, you not only lose health, but also gun power. Take a few hits on your way to a boss, and you could end up in a real jam. There are a few problems with this. First, it means that the worse you are at the game, the harder it becomes. This seems backwards. Second, gun power-ups are hard to come by. Some boss dungeons don't seem to have any at all. While health pickups drop from defeated enemies, gun capsules are few and far between. In stage 5, I found no gun capsules in the boss dungeon and was unable to defeat the boss with my terribly underpowered weapon. I ended up having to leave, go find another dungeon, and go through it twice in order to get back up to full power. Plus, I was not able to take a single hit while going through these or making my way back. My experience with the boss went from total frustration to being able to stand in one place and fire continuously for 20 seconds until the boss dropped dead. Getting stuck with low power is immensely frustrating, and having to go searching for capsules is not fun. Another issue with the overhead sections is that Jason carries his gun in his right hand, and he shoots off-center of his body. This makes lining up shots more difficult than it should be, and even makes some enemies impossible to hit from certain directions. There is a rather well-known glitch in this game that makes killing some of the bosses a lot easier. If you throw a grenade and pause the game when it damages the boss, the damage will continue while the game is paused. 
This means you can basically kill the boss in one shot. I gotta say, thank god for glitches and save states, without which I would have undoubtedly ripped this cartridge out of the console and smashed it into a thousand pieces. If you're not using save states, good luck. This game is very challenging and you get only five continues. Oh, and there's no password system or way to save, so you have to beat the whole thing in one go. While there's a lot of fun to be had with Blaster Master, it also does a lot of things that piss me off too. In some areas, it's just mean. Power-ups get placed behind spikes. With no jump ability in the overhead levels, there's no way to get these without losing both health and weapon power, so they're only there to taunt you. Often upon entering a new screen, an enemy will be waiting right at the entrance and will be immensely difficult to avoid unless you know it's gonna be there. The length of the game is also padded out by forcing you to backtrack to get to new areas. For example, to get from stage 6 to 7, you need to go back through stages 5, 4, 1, and 2. Having to backtrack and explore the dungeons that don't have bosses for power-ups doesn't really add anything to the game, and it could have been a tighter, more enjoyable experience without these things. My feelings on Blaster Master are similar to many of the more difficult NES games I've played recently. Had I played this game as a 10-year-old with only a handful of games to play, the difficulty, length, and exploration required would have been positive things. However, as an adult, with a lot of options, it just seems excessive. Blaster Master is in turns a lot of fun and extremely grueling. The platforming and vehicle combat sections are the real standout here, while the overhead action is extremely punishing and a little awkward due to how your shots don't line up with where your character is standing. While I appreciate that this game combined multiple different genres, I really found myself looking forward to one while I dreaded the other. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. The game I'm reviewing today has all the hallmarks of a game I should really enjoy, but did I? It's Sexies. Zexies was developed by Hudson Soft and released for the NES in North America in 1990, though it came out in Japan two years prior. It combines two different gameplay styles, side-scrolling platforming and horizontal-scrolling shooting. It's the year 2777. The surface and population of Earth have been devastated by war many times over. Only five islands now exist which form the nation of Xexes. Humans now cohabitate with... Fairies? Yeah, it says fairies. Okay. One day, the mechanic fortress Garuza attacks, kills the king, and kidnaps his daughter along with the fairy queen from each island. You play Apollo, who's out to kick some Garuza ass, rescue some women folk, and set everything right. For an 8-bit game, there's a lot going on here, so please excuse this overly long description of the gameplay. Each odd-numbered level is a platformer on one of the five islands. Islands which are littered with doorways. Doors everywhere. Your goal is to find the kidnapped fairy queen. Along the way, you'll be attacked by all kinds of mechanical enemies, which you fight with your currently equipped weapon. There are five weapons, but you only have access to one at a time, and there aren't too many opportunities to switch between them. There are two different pickups that drop from defeated enemies and are strewn around the levels. E-balls are currency, which can be given to NPCs found through some of the doorways to buy new weapons, upgrade your current one, get hints about what's to come, or play minigames. There are also L-balls, which refill some of your health. You need to find the Hidden Devil miniboss, defeat him, and take his 4-star. Once you get the 4-star, you can progress to the Mechanic Castle, which is another platforming segment that is non-linear and a bit maze-like. In the middle of each castle is a hangar, where you'll find some mobile armor and do some horizontal shooting. These sections are also non-linear, and if you go through the wrong door at the end, you'll have to replay the section. At the end of the castle, there's a boss fight. 
The even-numbered levels are longer horizontal shooting segments. You shoot your main weapon with B, and throw an oddly arcing grenade with A. In these segments, you can pick up P capsules, which power up your weapon, and S capsules, which increase your speed. These levels also end in a boss fight, and I found them to be the most challenging parts of the game, as there's no way to regain life. They're a battle of attrition, and if you arrive at the boss with low health, it can easily one-shot you. So, NES, Hudson Soft, multiple different game types, one of which is shoot 'em up? I should love this game. I don't love this game. Problem number one. The horizontal shooting segments don't have auto-fire. Why would you design a shoot 'em up without auto-fire? My poor hands were so sore after every play session, and the shooting segments felt much more punishing than they should have been. Now, I know, turbo controllers are a thing, a thing which I don't happen to own for NES, but I think the lack of auto-fire is a design failure, not something to be bandaged over with another peripheral. The worst part of this is that there is a weapon in the game that does have continuous fire. It's the laser, a weapon which is only available in the platforming segments and not the shooting segments. Let's continue with things that bug me, shall we? A lot of the boss fights feel like they're meant to be cheesed. There are ones where you can stand in one spot, maybe taking one hit, and just spam the attack button as fast as you can to kill it before it kills you. The devil bosses in the platforming sections all look and behave the same. And the easiest way to beat them? Just jump through their face, taking significant damage, and shoot them in the back of the head repeatedly. My main issue with the platforming levels, though, is all those doorways. Now on paper, they don't seem like a problem. You go through a door and who knows what you'll find. Maybe it's a mini-boss where you can rescue a lady in a bathtub. Maybe it's a shop where you can buy some sort of power-up. Or even better, a free weapon upgrade. But there are just so many of them. There's no sense of flow or momentum to the island parts of the game because there's a new door to go through every 10 steps you take, and you don't want to miss free weapon upgrades currency or the chance to heal. Enemies respawn when you leave the doorways, and there's also a bit of a control issue. You enter doors by pressing up on the D-pad, but you also use up to jump higher. Inadvertently re-entering doors because you're trying to jump away from an enemy making a beeline for you is quite frustrating. Now I'm not going to go full negative on this review because the game does have its high points and at least tries to do some interesting things. It just doesn't always execute them well. But here are some things I do enjoy. Some of the different weapons you get during platforming are pretty fun. The 45 b ball bounces off walls and objects at a 45 degree angle. A powered up moon ball creates a shield around you, and if you use it while pressing down, it turns into a whip, clearing out anything that approaches you. There are also some interesting magic effects, like a mirror which gives you a duplicate Apollo and basically doubles your firepower. The transitions between platforming and shooting, with bosses and mini-bosses peppered throughout, does keep you on your toes and keeps things interesting. The very last boss fight is completely different than anything that came before. There's a lot of variety. The high difficulty of the game is tempered by unlimited continues, along with the password save system if you need to step away. Maybe to punch something because you're mad about the lack of autofire. As for the more technical aspects, it's alright. The game looks pretty good, with interesting looking sprites and lots of color. I particularly like that all the cyborg riders for the horizontal shooting segments are unique and shaped like different animals. The music is hit and miss. While the main theme is quite catchy, a lot of the level music can get a bit repetitive and even a little grating. There is some slowdown when too many things are happening on screen. This is especially bad when using the mirror power-up. Zexies tries to do a lot of cool things, it just doesn't always nail the execution. And while I found my time with the game more frustrating than fun, I wouldn't necessarily tell people to avoid it. However, if you are going to give Zexies a shot, I'd recommend bringing some patience. And probably a turbo controller. Maybe do some thumb exercises. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. 
The game I'm reviewing today originally starred Mickey Mouse, but had to be changed when it was released in North America. It's Kid Clown in Nightmare World. Kid Clown in Nightmare World was developed by Chemco and released on NES in 1993. While on the way to a circus performance with his family, Kid Clown is approached by the evil magician Nightmare, who wants help opening a treasure vault. When Kid Clown refuses, his family is taken and he needs to get them back. This platformer features a not-so-typical way of defeating enemies. You use balloons. You can throw balloons ahead of you to take out monsters or open treasure chests. You can also throw straight up into the air or place them on the ground in front of you. If you jump, you can throw in eight different directions, which is how you defeat most bosses. Balloons also help you traverse the world. Bounce off a balloon to jump higher, or hold on to one to float temporarily and get across wide gaps or go over difficult terrain. There's no run button, but the longer you move in one direction, the faster you will go, which helps you get through obstacles like collapsing bridges or series of small gaps. The balloons are fun to use and make you very versatile. However, the levels don't take full advantage of your extra mobility, so they're a little lacking in challenge. Kid Clown begins with a short starting level to introduce you to the game, then you go to an overworld map that contains five stages and a final stage where you face off against Nightmare. Each stage has its own theme, and you start out where most of these kinds of family-friendly platformers start, in a meadow with green trees and blue skies. There are also worlds themed after toys, where you face off against tin soldiers and falling puzzle pieces, Candy, where you fight lollipop snails and flying ice cream cones, and the Arctic, where you battle snowmen and terrain that ranges from slippery ice to snow that functions like quicksand. The most unique is Stage 3, the Big Bad Beanstalk, which adds some verticality to the levels. In this one, you need to jump from leaf to leaf while avoiding flying bugs and exploding pea pods, plus some rockets which seem really out of place. It's nice that most of the levels in this stage have you moving in a different direction, as otherwise, there's not a ton of variety in the gameplay. There are a number of treasure chests scattered around, which can contain a few different things. You get hearts to refill your life meter, extra lives, a lightning bolt which makes you briefly invincible, or an item which reverses your controls. This one is annoying, but doesn't feel overly punishing. You also collect strawberries, which are called chips on your HUD, which are used in a bonus game. Each stage ends in a boss fight, and while mechanically there's not much difference to how you defeat them, you just jump and throw balloons, the sprites are very unique and sometimes impressive looking. The stage 1 boss is a giant owl, which swoops in at you and is the easiest of the bunch. Stage 2 has a lanternfish boss, which doesn't really fit with the stage's toy theme, and also looks and acts very similar to an enemy from Mega Man 2. There's also another segment that reminded me of part of Quick Man's stage in Mega Man 2, but without any of the precision or good level design. Stage 3 again has what I think is one of the more interesting bosses, a giant cyclops at the top of the beanstalk. This fight gives you a couple different unpredictable things to avoid while you throw balloons at the Cyclops' head. In between each level, there's a bonus game where you launch balloons at moving items. Each strawberry you collected in the prior stage gives you one balloon. Here you can get health, items which increase your life bar past the default three hearts, and extra lives. Each of the items travels at a different speed, and they can switch directions suddenly. I failed miserably at this my first few times seeing it, but after getting a handle on the timing, I soon found myself swimming in extra lives. The final stage is Nightmare's Castle, which has a lot of conveyor belts and moving platforms. It's slightly maze-like and full of doors. Some are shortcuts, some return you to previous areas, and some make you fight bosses from previous stages again. 
At the end, if you choose the right door, you fight Nightmare in a three-phase fight. Nightmare is pretty aggro. Come at me, bro! I have to talk about this game's aesthetic a little bit. It's all over the place. Kid Clown was released quite late in the NES's lifespan, at a time when some developers were pushing the hardware to its limits, with games like Kirby's Adventure, which had an amazing color palette and some cool visual effects. Kid Clown makes use of a wide variety of the colors available on the NES, but nothing really goes together. It starts out with a very basic dark red, blue, and green color scheme in the intro. Stage 1 expands upon those colors and looks alright. But stages 2 and 5, themed after toys and candy, are a garish mess of colors set against ugly pastel backgrounds. Just because you can use 54 colors doesn't mean you should. There's no consistent visual style as you go from the intro, to the stages, to the bonus game, and finally the castle. As far as the music goes, I felt it could have been a bit more circusy considering the theme, but otherwise it's fine. Not fantastic, but not bad. The game's performance is mostly good, but there were a couple areas with some tremendous slowdown and flickering. One other complaint I have is that I don't like where the camera rests as you scroll from left to right. Whereas most great NES platformers, like Mario or Mega Man, center the character horizontally in the middle of the screen, here the default position is about two-thirds of the way to the right. This means less time to react to things as they appear. As I mentioned, this is not a very challenging game, so less reaction time isn't a huge deal. It's just a design decision I don't like. Let's take a quick look at the original version of this game before we wrap up. Kid Clown was originally known as Mickey Mouse 3 Dream Balloon. It was released for the Famicom in Japan in 1992. Kemco wanted to release it for NES, but Capcom had exclusive rights to make Disney games in North America, so the title and characters had to be changed. In the original game, Minnie Mouse won't wake up, so Mickey has to enter her dreams to defeat her five nightmares before fighting the one ultimately responsible for her condition. Which is kinda intense. The gameplay and levels are all pretty much the same. A few notable changes include the intro and ending scenes, some changes to a couple of the enemies, such as replacing an alligator in Dream Balloon with a clam, and a dragon sub-boss in the final stage being replaced with a pterodactyl. The design of the final boss is also a little different. Dream Balloon also uses music from It's a Small World, which obviously was not included in Kid Clown. Kid Clown in Nightmare World is short, simple, and relatively easy. It's worth spending an hour with to beat it once, but it doesn't give the player much of a reason to go back and replay it. While the balloon mechanics are fun and unique, there's not much else that makes it stand out among all the other NES platformers out there. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. The game I'm reviewing today was voted on by my supporters on Patreon, and it just edged out the second place game by one vote. It's the sequel to one of my favorite NES games, Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2. Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2 was developed by Nintendo R&D 3 and released in 1994. It's an action-adventure game that continues the story of Mike Jones and his archaeologist uncle. At the end of the first game, they had rescued a group of alien children from the evil Zoda who had destroyed their planet. This time around, Mike is trying to stop him for good. To do this, he must travel through time and collect tetrad blocks before Zoda can get them himself. The game opens up with a fairly lengthy story chapter. Of the NES games I've played, this is the most story-heavy one I've seen, with a fair bit of dialogue and some great close-up portraits of the characters. At the end of the chapter, Mike solves a cipher which transports him to prehistoric times. 
This was a very enjoyable story intro, but when the actual gameplay starts, it does so in the most annoying way possible. You're taken to an overworld map and soon come to a snowfield, which is full of pits to fall through. Invisible pits. When you fall through one of them, you'll be taken to a mini dungeon, with a more zoomed in overhead view, and have to fight some enemies before exiting back to the snowfield. This repeats ad nauseum. Walk a few steps, fall in a hole, fight some enemies. I went through that loop five times before I managed to get through the area. The experience of the first 10 or 15 minutes of the game really encapsulates the whole thing. It would do something fun and interesting, then immediately follow it up with something frustrating. Throughout most of the game's nine chapters, the core gameplay loop involves traveling through an overworld map and talking to people to gather information on what to do next, then venturing into a dungeon or two to fight enemies, collect items, and defeat a boss. Once Mike finds the Tetrad in each area, he's whisked to another point in time. Zoda's Revenge looks and plays very similarly to the first game, but some significant changes have been made. Mike can now move and attack diagonally, in 8 total directions instead of just 4. He's also got a lot more mobility in his jumping. Gone is his trusty yo-yo, and instead his main weapon is a throwable axe, which is eventually upgraded to a dagger and a katana. His psychic shockwave attack is also upgradable and gets stronger based on your current health. There are also a few other new limited-use weapons, like a three-way shot. The stiff movement in the first game is something I've complained about. You can only move in four directions, and it forces you to move in straight lines, as if you were on a grid. While the change to allow diagonal movement and attack opens up new possibilities, it's not terribly easy to control with your basic NES D-pad, and the dungeons still seem to be built with the grid system in mind. Making diagonal jumps over water or obstacles always seemed to be a crapshoot. Sometimes they'd go as planned, and sometimes I'd jump too far or end up jumping in the wrong direction. In the original, movement and jumping was stiff and restrained, but reliable. Here, I had a lot more freedom, but rarely felt like I was fully in control. The dungeon design is visually similar to the first game, but adds some new features. Screens can be multi-level and often include raised platforms to jump onto. Enemies here can only be attacked if you get on their level or attack while jumping. Disappearing and reappearing platforms are abundant and can make for some challenging platforming. There are also a lot of conveyor belts, which will carry Mike in the direction they've been stamped with and can provide extra speed and extra challenges, especially when these are used during boss fights. The boss fights are some of my favorite parts of the game. There are some really clever ones that make the most of the platforming challenges introduced through other parts of the dungeons. In the sewers of London, there is a stationary blob that you have to circle around, attacking it in between jumping across disappearing platforms. In Camelot, there's a fight where you travel in a loop on a fast-moving conveyor belt as a mounted knight flies back and forth, shooting at you. Regular enemies in the dungeon aren't anything too interesting. Many are reskins of enemies from the first game. There are smaller, fast-moving monsters and larger, lumbering ones. Some fly and some shoot projectiles. I found the difficulty curve in the game was all over the place. It wasn't a gradual increase in challenge, but rather a whole lot of difficulty spikes. Taking damage in games is never fun, but Zoda's Revenge seems especially punishing when you get hit. Usually when you take damage in a game, you get a second or two of invulnerability so you can recover. Not here though. When you take damage, you're briefly stunned and can be damaged again almost immediately. It makes it incredibly hard to recover and get away from the thing that's just hit you. There were so many times I went from full health to almost dead in a matter of seconds because I just couldn't move out of danger once I took that first hit. To top this off, once you reach a certain health level, you're subjected to constant shrill beeping, reminding you that you're almost dead. There are ways to recover health, 
You can find small hearts to instantly refill some of your meter, and stars, which you need to collect five of before they take effect. Though I saw these at the beginning and end of the game, they were mysteriously absent in many of the chapters. What you end up relying on more are medicine jars, which are inventory items that you can use to restore five hearts. These are much more abundant than they were in the first game, and limited to use in the dungeon where you find them. In the final chapter, you can collect a lot of medicine jars, and you should, to prepare yourself for an immensely punishing rush of all the previous bosses that you'll need to defeat again. I really liked the time travel aspect of the game as it gave the opportunity to visit a lot of different locations and people. The amount of story and dialogue presented really made the most of that. In Chapter 3, you end up in Ancient Egypt, fetching a pizza for Cleopatra. Chapter 5 whisks us to the Italian Renaissance, where we talk to Da Vinci and a bunch of highly stereotyped Italian characters. Chapter 6's Transylvania gives the opportunity for a spooky level with skeletons and ghosts. The dialogue is funny in a really corny kind of way and keeps things interesting as well as providing some much needed downtime between dungeons. Visually though, I'm not too impressed. Considering this came out in 1994, it was one of the last NES releases, I expected an improvement over the first game's graphics. However, I didn't find that for the most part. The dungeon environments and enemy designs were about the same quality, and though traveling through time gave more variety in locations, few of them looked that great. The couple standouts in terms of visuals were the Italian overworld, which has some nice colors, and the close-up character portraits, though some are better than others. The music is also not the best. This may be partly nostalgia talking, but the first game's soundtrack was so catchy and memorable. Here, I couldn't hum a few bars from any track once I turned the game off. Zoda's Revenge is a roller coaster of highs and lows. Every time I started to really like the game, I'd be faced with a terrible level that was painful to get through. The game's intro is impressive and followed up with the snowfield full of invisible holes to fall in repeatedly. Egypt has amusing characters and story, and an awful maze that you need to go through mostly blind. The Italy chapter has a dungeon with some interesting timing-based platforming and unique enemies that you need to direct into a hole rather than fighting, and then a giant castle maze full of, you guessed it, invisible pits to fall into. As the game wraps up, fans of the original are given a real treat, and then punished with nine difficult boss fights in a row. Zoda's Revenge is not a bad sequel, but it doesn't quite live up to the original for me. Though there are things I like about it, there's interesting boss fights, I like traveling to different times and places, and some of the dungeon layouts are fun. But taking any damage was overly punishing, and any level that involved mazes or invisible pits really drove me up the wall. The change to movement and controls tries to improve upon Star Tropics 1, but doesn't quite succeed. I think it's worth giving the game a shot, though if I'm going to be completely honest, if I hadn't committed to reviewing this game, I probably would have quit right around that first field of pitfalls. One last thing. Why in God's name is this called Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2 instead of Star Tropics 2 Zoda's Revenge? All that I ask is that I am able to keep my games in alphabetical order and keep series together. Is that so much to ask? Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about one of the more technically impressive and challenging shoot-'em-ups out there, along with the event that it was created for. It's Rekka. Summer Carnival 92 Rekka was developed by KID and published by Naxat Soft for the Famicom. Rekka is a vertically scrolling shooter, known for its intense difficulty and ferocious speed. Because of the late date of release, July 17, 1992, almost two years after the Super Famicom came out, and the fact that it was created specifically for a competition, 
The cartridge is quite rare and expensive, with a loose cart going for hundreds of dollars. The game never made its way outside of Japan in any official capacity until it released on the 3DS eShop in 2013. This NES cart is obviously a reproduction. Before I get into the review of Rekka, I want to talk a little bit about the competition it was created for and how that came about. If you're a retro gaming fan in North America, you probably know about the Nintendo World Championship, which toured 30 U.S. cities in 1990. Not for the big prizes, not for the money. We're doing it for fun, we're doing it for Mario. Players were challenged to a custom game of Super Mario Bros., Rad Racer, and Tetris. Finalists were awarded with what's now one of the most rare NES cartridges. This event was a one-time deal, at least until it was resurrected in 2015. You might know a little less about the Nintendo Challenge Championship, which toured Canada and took place before the World Championship. In that, a mobile gaming room installed in a 40-foot truck traveled across Canada, challenging players to a game of Super Mario Bros. While these events were one-offs, over in Japan, national video game competitions were a yearly event. Hudsonsoft is a game developer and publisher that's quite well known. They made such series as Adventure Island, Bonk, Bomberman, Mario Party, and of course my favorite, Felix the Cat. From 1985 to 2000, Hudson Soft held a yearly games competition in Japan, the Hudson All Japan Caravan Festival. Most years, this contest focused on a single game, and up until the later years, it was generally a shoot 'em up, or STG, which is the common abbreviation for shooting games in Japan. Caravan games are specifically shoot 'em ups that are played for score, usually in rounds of two or five minutes. When these competitions started, the games did not have timers or caravan modes built in, and judges had to use stopwatches as the kids played. The games also didn't have auto-fire at this point, so being able to tap that button as fast as possible was just as important as reacting to what was going on on screen. Elementary school kids from all over Japan would take part in the contest, practicing all summer before competing for the title of national champion. While the first few years featured Famicom games, from 1988 onwards the games were all played on Hudson Soft's own hardware, the PC Engine. The Star Soldier series was heavily featured in the competitions, though in 89 they changed things up a little and featured Gunhead, known outside of Japan as Blazing Lasers. Post-1992, the caravan moved away from its shoot 'em up focus and started featuring less punishing games, like the Bomberman series. The Naxat Soft Summer Carnival was developer and publisher Naxat Soft's answer to Hudson Summer Caravan. Though Naxat Soft was quite prolific, it isn't that well known outside of Japan, as they tended to only make and publish games there, mostly for the PC Engine. These included everything from golf and pool sims to experimental beat em up Kaze Kiri Ninja Action, the PC Engine port of Double Dragon 2 and cued em up Koryun, Child of Dragon. They also worked with notable shoot 'em up developer Compile on the Crush Pinball series and their first summer carnival game, 1991's Seirai Senshi Spriggan. Spriggan is clearly influenced by Compile's Musha, and was even going to be part of the LS series while it was in development. Spriggan is quite a beautiful game, and since it was to be part of the Summer Carnival, it was made with a special 2-minute score attack mode, in addition to the regular story mode. 1992's Carnival featured two games, Rekka, which we'll get to soon, and Alzadik for PC Engine. Alzadik is a little underwhelming for the home player. It features different score attack modes, but the story mode only contains two stages, 
each of which can be finished in about three minutes. 1993 featured Nexer Special on the PC Engine, a re-release of Nexer, which added score and time attack modes and removed the game's cutscenes. Nexer was made by Kaneko and is very similar in looks and gameplay to Superstar Soldier, which they also made, and was Hudson's 1990 caravan game. Naxet Summer Carnival was not nearly as popular or successful as Hudson's, and it ended here, after its third year. So now that we know the history of the Summer Game Carnival, let's get to Rekka. What's the game like, and why do we still talk about it today? Though published by Naxatsoft, Rekka was developed by Kid, probably best known over here for Kickmaster and G.I. Joe on the NES. The name Rekka means Raging Fire or Blazing Fire, hinting at its intensity. Rekka shows its provenance as a competition game at every turn. It's very fast and immensely challenging, a game you need to practice and learn in order to get through it, or have a hope of getting an impressive score. From the main menu, there are three game modes, two of which are caravan modes. Score Attack challenges you to get the highest possible score in two minutes, and Time Attack tasks you with getting to one million points in the shortest time possible, with a five minute time limit. And then there's the normal mode, which consists of four stages. There are five different primary weapons that you can switch between and power up by grabbing the blue pickups, with letters denoting what weapon they contain. The primary weapons are pretty standard, forward-facing blasts, two types of spread shots, homing attacks, and laser beams. Each of these has their own strengths and weaknesses, and some which start out unimpressive at low power levels, like the laser, can get very strong by continuing to grab that same type of power capsule. There are also five sub-weapons, which come from the red pickups. These take the form of smaller pods at the side of your ship, which can fire in different directions or patterns. They can face forwards, backwards, fire in the direction opposite of where you're heading, rotate around you, or seek out enemies. You can also press select to change the speed of your ship. One interesting thing about the weapons is that they're fired separately as opposed to everything firing all at once. You fire your primary weapon by holding down B and your secondary weapon by holding down A. This allows for some more adaptability when it comes to Rekka's most interesting mechanic, the bomb. When you're not firing your primary weapon, a bomb in front of your ship charges up. While it's present, it acts as a bit of a shield deflecting smaller enemies and projectiles that come straight at you. You can fire your secondary weapon while charging the bomb, so you're not completely helpless. If you fire while the bomb is fully charged, which you can tell by the energy meter at the bottom of the screen, the bomb will detonate, causing a large explosion that takes up a good amount of space and persists for a few seconds. Using the bomb is key, especially on boss fights. It will continuously damage whatever it hits and provide protection for you by killing projectiles that attempt to pass through it. When starting a game on normal mode, you get about 10 seconds of relative ease before things ramp up considerably. The speed at which enemies and projectiles come at you is remarkable, as is the sheer number of things happening on screen at once. Though bullet hell wasn't a subgenre at this point, I think there's a good argument for Rekka being the first of its kind. And all of this happens with minimal slowdown. It's amazing how much can be going on at once without performance suffering. There's a bit of flickering, which is hard to avoid, but the only times I really experienced any slowness or lag was on a couple of the larger bosses. And all of this was on the Famicom. The game is impressive looking, though at times, overwhelming. The purple smoke effect in the back half of stage 1 is quite lovely. However, when this effect is in red and combined with a similarly colored boss as well as other background items in stage 2, it's just too much. Plus, a red and magenta color scheme? Blech. A lot of stage 2 made my eyes feel like they were about to start bleeding from too much visual stimulation. Thankfully, the other stages don't suffer from this problem. 
The first three stages feature mid and end bosses, while the fourth is a rush containing bosses you've fought before, as well as some new surprises. I found these to be the most challenging parts of the game. If you don't immediately pick up on the pattern and execute your dodges flawlessly, a boss can easily burn through all your lives and result in a game over within seconds. Though the speed, attack patterns, and sheer number of enemies on screen make Rekka wickedly hard, there are also some mechanics that make things a little more forgiving. When you lose a life, you just keep going from where you are. You don't have to worry about going back to the start of the level or a checkpoint. This is appreciated, as learning the game takes enough repetition as it is. There are also one-ups to find that drop from enemies. And, though losing a life means you lose all your upgrades, primary and secondary weapon power-ups are plentiful. You'll have time to power yourself up again. Unless you lose a life on a boss. But that is where the bomb comes in. You always have this, and it can help you survive seemingly desperate situations. The UI tells you everything you need to know. Your speed, shield, lives left, score, top score, and the time of your run. This is very useful, though to be honest, I rarely had a chance to glance down at these numbers as I played. Taking my eyes off my ship tended to end poorly. The score and time attack modes take place on a different stage than the normal game, which provides some nice variety. Here, it's all about getting the highest score you can, as fast as you can, and it requires some real strategy. You gain points for killing enemies, picking up the blue wings which drop, and also, somewhat counterintuitively, from not firing your weapon. The competitors of the Summer Carnival surely had to practice a ton and plan out their strategy in great detail in order to have a chance at winning. Rekka also features two hidden modes. Once you've cleared normal, you can hard reset the system to open up the hard mode, which contains seven stages and takes twice as long to beat as the normal mode. Zanki Attack, unlocked by a secret button combination, starts you with 50 lives, but makes any enemy you kill release extra bullets as they die. There's also a hidden screen, which lets you choose your stage or listen to the game's music. And speaking of music, it's also quite incredible. Composer Nobuyuki Shioda wanted a dark and heavy sound, and said he was inspired by Detroit techno. The low bass and drum sounds from DPCM samples were made so prominent by reducing the volume on the other sound channels. Like the visuals, Rekka's music is fast, intense, and impressive, but can occasionally be a little overwhelming. They certainly fit together well. Intense is the word that best describes Rekka. The gameplay, sounds, and visuals all come at you fast and furious. It's great if you want to take on a challenge, but be prepared to die. A lot. I think we still talk about Rekka today because it's a technical marvel, exhibiting the pinnacle of programming on the Famicom. And also because it's one of the last remnants of the annual Summer Shoot 'em Up competition, a phenomenon that I kinda wish would make a comeback. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm back to the NES and I'm covering a game that stars a martial arts master, actor, stuntman, and even singer. It's Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu. Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu was developed by Now Production and published by Hudson Soft. It was released for NES in 1990 and is an action platformer. In a very short intro sequence, we see Jackie and his twin sister Josephine. She is captured by an evil sorcerer, and Jackie needs to get her back so they can save China together. The gameplay is just what you'd expect from a kung fu game. You can jump, kick, punch, and crouch, and the controls are tight and responsive. There are special moves you can get from pickups and use a limited amount of times, like 180 and 360 degree spin kicks, an upward sky attack, and Tornado Attack, which somersaults you through the air, doing damage to anything you touch. 
There's also a limited use special ranged attack called Psycho Wave, which can be charged up by holding down the B button. The UI at the bottom of the screen shows your current health level, which has a maximum of 6 hit points, along with your current special move and how many uses you have left. The five dots show how many uses of Psycho Wave you have left, and the number next to the red orb shows how many bonus jade you've collected. This is dropped by enemies, and if you collect 30 of them, your health and Psycho Wave uses will be refilled. The game is short, consisting of only five levels, each of which ends in a boss fight. You'll go through various outdoor levels filled with animal threats, indoor areas filled with spike pits and obstacles, avoid a floor made of bubbling lava, jump across the backs of flying turtles in the sky, and even see some more mechanical-looking locations. Each level changes things up considerably as you move from screen to screen. For example, in level 1, you'll start out outside, seeing waterfalls and forests in the distance, and fighting animals like birds and tigers. Then, you'll move indoors to traverse water obstacles and seesawing platforms while being accosted by flying fish and disembodied hands that toss nunchucks. Then you'll face spike pits and other martial artists before climbing a series of wooden platforms that take you towards the boss. The way the gameplay changes keeps things interesting. At some points, it's a pure platforming challenge. At others, there will be tougher enemies to defeat or avoid. There are auto-scrolling segments mixed in which force you to move quickly and anticipate challenges and moving platforms to ride. Each level also has a couple hidden bonus stages. If you step in the right spot, a bell will appear and hitting it will take you to these stages. Some involve leaping from cloud to cloud, and some are about hitting target dummies. The score you get in these will be used to refill your ranged attack uses, health, or even grant extra continues. However, there is one level that missed the mark for me and seemed less impressive than the others, and that's level 3. It starts with floating platforms and turtle shells you'll need to jump across. While this isn't bad in theory, it's the same thing for six screens, and other than a couple birds at the end, the only real threat is falling. Once that's done, you'll get to a water area, where you can ride a floating log through various obstacles. Again, not a bad environment or terrible gameplay, but this goes on for eight screens before you finally get to the boss. It just seems like less effort went into this level than the others, and it got very repetitive. Thankfully, this is the only one that made me feel this way. The bosses are really where your kung fu skills are put to the test. You'll be fighting everything from a Buddha statue to a Shaolin giant, and my favorite, the huge pink cyclops in the sky. I like this one because you have to handle bouncing on clouds as you try to avoid his attacks, and punch him right in his eye. The penultimate boss, Mad Marshall, is the most challenging, as he's the same size as you and has the same skills. It's a bit like battling yourself, and the combat strategies that worked for previous bosses don't really work here. The final boss introduces something completely new, as you fight on a floating platform that you can maneuver. One of the things that stands out immediately upon starting the game is the large, expressive sprites. They really give the game some character. Depending on what you're doing, Jackie will go through a number of clearly visible emotions. Happy. Determined. Angry. Pleased with himself. Ow! My ass! And dead. I guess those last couple aren't really emotions. Likewise, the bosses also have some very amusing facial expressions, especially when you hit them. The wonderful sprites, along with the attractive locations that make good use of color, make the game very aesthetically pleasing. The hanging scroll the overworld map is pictured on is a very charming finishing touch. The music is also quite good. It's not something I found particularly memorable, which I know is something many will disagree on, but it is energetic and fits each level well. 
In terms of difficulty, Jackie Chan does have its challenges. When you take damage, the period of invulnerability is incredibly short and makes it easy to get hit again immediately. But I still found it easier than many NES platformers. It does many things that make it more forgiving when you do make mistakes, as well as feel less dated than it otherwise could. When I review older games, I review them as I am now, an adult with a ton of games to choose from and 30 years of gaming experience to draw upon. Now I don't have unrealistic expectations, I know what was technically feasible when these games were made, but many of them had design decisions that felt overly punishing and make the games feel less fun to play now. Things like instant death mechanics, no checkpoints, lack of auto-fire in shooters, or no saves in very long games. Action Kung Fu was designed in such a way that feels less punishing to someone playing it now and skips most of those retro frustrations. Though at any point in the game you only have a single life, you get six hit points to work with, so getting hit by an enemy once isn't the end of the world. There are also very few instant death mechanics. When I first saw water in a level, I assumed that landing in it would kill me. Not the case. Turns out water isn't damaging to Jackie like it is so many other platforming heroes. Even more dangerous elements, like spikes and lava, will only reduce your health rather than outright kill you. There are no bottomless pits to fall in, and when you miss a jump on one of the climbing screens, you'll just drop down until you land on another platform. When you lose some of your health, there are many ways to get it back. Frogs, which drop the special attack abilities, can also drop noodle bowls, which give you health. You can also get health from the bonus stages, collecting 30 jade, and it's topped up every time you start a new level. But if you do lose all six health and get a game over, which will still likely happen, you get five continues, which can also be increased in the bonus stages. When you use a continue, you'll start at the beginning of the same screen you were on, rather than having to start from the beginning of the level. There's even a cheat code for 99 continues written right into the manual, should you need it. Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu is a fantastic platformer. It has colorful, great-looking levels, fun boss fights, and a lot of charm. While it can be challenging to play, it's very forgiving of mistakes, making it much less frustrating to play than many other games of its era. I highly recommend this one. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. The game I'm talking about today was originally supposed to be a Terminator game. It's Journey to Silius. Journey to Silius was released for the NES in 1990. It was developed by Sunsoft, who had also made excellent games like Blaster Master and Batman. It could safely be categorized as either a platformer or a run-and-gun. You play Jay. He's on a mission to avenge his colonist father, who has been killed by terrorists. My first impression of Journey to Silius was that it was trying to emulate the early Mega Man games. The gameplay and platforming obstacles you'll face are similar. You'll also get access to multiple different special weapons to augment your basic pea shooter. And you have both a health and a weapon energy meter and can find pickups to help refill both. The game's first four levels all follow the same basic pattern. You'll have to run and gun your way through enemies and environmental dangers before fighting a sub-boss who is significantly tougher. When you defeat it, it will drop a new special weapon for you, which you get to keep for the rest of the game. Picking up the weapon will teleport you to a new room where you'll fight the final boss. There are six weapons in total, which can be accessed and switched to by pressing start. The machine gun fires in bursts of three. The shotgun does a spread shot. The laser is a concentrated beam of damage. The homing missile will target onto enemies. And the grenade launcher really looks like more of a missile launcher that hits very hard. Using any of the special weapons uses up some of your gun energy meter, so I tended to only bring them out for bosses or particularly tough enemies, and relied on the basic handgun for the majority of the time. 
There are two types of capsules you can find from defeated enemies. Pink ones will give you back some life power, while blue will give you gun energy. The pink ones were very rare. I'd often go through an entire level without seeing a single one, so they really can't be relied on to help you recover from taking a few unexpected hits. The blue ones drop more frequently, but neither restore much in terms of your energy bars. The fifth and final level of Journey to Silius is a bit of an exception to the rest of the game, as it's an auto-scroller which contains no enemies, just environmental obstacles and traps followed up by two big boss fights. I found Journey to Silius very challenging. It's the kind of game that requires some memorization in order to get through it unscathed. There are a number of areas where taking damage just can't be avoided if you don't already know what's coming up. Places like this, jumping down to a new screen that you can't see yet. If you haven't already been through this, you'd have no way of knowing where you should land to avoid enemies on the ground or on the walls. Plus, your jumping trajectory is pretty much set. You can't adjust yourself much mid-jump. In this particularly frustrating part of level 4, you have to jump across falling platforms. Enemies often appear on screen just as you hit a certain point, and if you're already jumping and not firing your weapon constantly, they'll knock you into the abyss. Level 5 was also full of places where you needed to know what part of the screen to stay in if you wanted to make it safely through the obstacles. While you only get three lives, there are, thankfully, unlimited continues. The game is quite short, a no-death run would take only about 20 minutes, while I spent significantly more time with the game myself because of the difficulty. The bosses ended up being the easiest parts for me. While they look intimidating, each follows a predictable pattern, and if you save your gun energy and choose a good weapon, they can be taken out without too much difficulty. Jay is not the most agile of player characters, but overall the controls were good. Though you can only fire directly in front of you, you can lay down to shoot things low to the ground, or avoid things, and everything is fairly responsive. While Journey to Silius was meant to be a Terminator game, Sunsoft lost the license at some point during development. They had to change the game's story and the planned artwork. However, I question how much else got changed, because the game still looks and feels like it could be based on the Terminator. Stage 1 is meant to take place in an abandoned space colony, but it certainly brings to mind the vision of Earth's future from the Terminator. All the enemies you'll be fighting in the game are robots, some quite familiar looking. The final boss sure looks like a T-800. I guess the terrorists fighting space colonization are all robots, because there are no other humans in this game. The story is kind of nonsensical, but also not really important. Journey to Silius looks and sounds great. Though I'm usually a fan of bright and colorful games, Silius uses a more restrained color palette to great effect. There are a lot of greens, blues, and grays used to give a metallic and futuristic look. Stage 1 creates my favorite environment by having war-torn cities and ominous-looking clouds as the backdrop to Jay's travels. The soundtrack is a little limited, since there's really only five level themes, plus the boss and title music, but overall, it's great. I particularly like the tracks for stages 2 and 4. They're quite bassy, and a little more morose than the more upbeat themes of the other levels. The sound effects are also satisfying, especially that of your gun firing and enemies exploding. Journey to Silius is impressive, but also frustrating at times. Though the gameplay, music, and graphics are all very well done, it has the kind of level design that means you need to know what dangers are coming up ahead of you in order to avoid them. How much patience you have will probably be the determining factor for how much enjoyment you get out of the game. If you're fine with memorization and some repetition, then it's great. However, if you're lacking in the patience department, you might want to skip this one. If you're a fan of the original Nintendo Entertainment System, then you've probably played at least a couple of the Disney Capcom games. 
These games were very popular in their day and have managed to stay relevant now because of a notable remaster in 2013 and the 2017 release of the Disney Afternoon Collection. Today, I'm talking about the game that kicked off the very successful partnership between Disney and Capcom. It's DuckTales. Woo! DuckTales first came out for the NES in North America in September 1989, and about a year later was ported to the Game Boy. It's a platformer where you play Scrooge McDuck, who's searching for lost treasures that will increase his fortune. When looking at how the DuckTales game came to be, we have to go all the way back to 1947. That's when the character Scrooge McDuck was created by Carl Barks, working for the Disney Company. He first appeared in a Donald Duck comic in a story called Christmas on Bear Mountain. Named after Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol, he is Donald Duck's uncle and was presented as old, miserly, and misanthropic, traits which would soften considerably over the years. In 1952, he got his own self-titled comic. Here, he became more of a philanthropist and explorer, often going on adventures with his young nephews Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Now, in 2019, the Uncle Scrooge comic is still being published. In 1986, Disney decided to capitalize on the popularity of Uncle Scrooge and started working on an animated series. Many episodes focused on Scrooge and his nephews seeking out treasures or preventing his nemeses from stealing his fortune in order to stay the richest duck in the world. He's very single-minded in his capitalist pursuits. Animation for the series was farmed out to Wang Film Productions, a Taiwanese-American studio who started out doing work for Hanna-Barbera and would go on to animate shows like Bobby's World and Rugrats. The quality of the animation was much higher than most cartoons of the time, and also much more expensive. Running for 100 episodes over four seasons, DuckTales was incredibly successful for Disney, and they would go on to commission similar cartoons, like Rescue Rangers, Tailspin, and Darkwing Duck. These shows would also go on to be made into video games. Alright, so technically, DuckTales wasn't the first time that the names Capcom and Disney appeared on an NES box together. The first Disney game on the NES was actually Mickey Mouse Capades, which came out in North America in 1988. Though looking at the box would make you think that Capcom had made it, it was actually Hudson Soft who developed the game. Capcom only published it in North America. Though the game is similar in format to DuckTales, it's a platformer that has five levels, it's not overly impressive in either gameplay or appearance. In DuckTales, you play as Scrooge as he travels around the world looking for five lost treasures. He'll visit places from deep in a mine in Africa to the moon. There's no real in-game introduction. As soon as you press start, you'll find yourself on a level selection screen, and you can approach them in any order you like. Though there are only five levels, they are all quite large, non-linear, and full of optional secret paths to explore. There are also items which can restore health or give you money, which Scrooge wants to collect as much of as possible. Magic coins can make you invulnerable, and Scrooge dolls can give you extra lives. Scrooge has a health bar which consists of three hearts, but this can be expanded by finding hidden objects. If you lose all your health, you'll be sent back to the start of the level. If you lose all your lives, it's game over, and there are no continues. Certain aspects of DuckTales gameplay might remind you of the beginning of another incredibly popular Capcom series, Mega Man. There's the quick start without introduction to the story, the level select screen which allows you to tackle them in any order you choose, the cute facial expressions of the main character. The levels also have a lot of verticality rather than straight left to right side scrolling. DuckTales and Mega Man shared a lot of the same developers, and DuckTales likely even used the Mega Man engine. Tokuro Fujiwara produced DuckTales, Mega Man, and most Capcom games of this time, including future Disney games. 
Graphic design on DuckTales was done by Keiji Inafune, who is often known as the father of Mega Man, and is credited as the character designer on the early games. Both DuckTales and the first two Mega Man games were programmed by Nobuyuki Matsushima and had Yoshihiro Sagaguchi as the sound producer. Despite sharing much of the same development team, DuckTales still stands on its own as a unique game. In terms of gameplay, it's your basic platformer, but with one big twist. Scrooge can use his cane as a pogo stick in order to jump higher, traverse dangerous terrain, destroy obstacles, and take out enemies by jumping on their heads. He can also swing it like a golf club in order to launch items directly in front of him. How you get on with the pogo mechanic will probably be the biggest factor in how much you enjoy the game. When I first played DuckTales, which was just a few years ago, I did not like this pogo mechanic at all. At this point, I had already played the remaster, maybe even played Shovel Knight, and I just found the execution here really awkward, and I quickly abandoned the game. Even the game's manual makes the pogoing sound complicated and awkward, as it dedicates four paragraphs to explaining how to jump. Seriously, four paragraphs about jumping in a game with a two-button controller. Recently, I decided I wanted to give the game another chance and give myself time to get used to it. This time around, I found it much more enjoyable and could appreciate more of the game's positives. DuckTales has a great style, and I love how expressive Scrooge's sprite is, especially when taking damage. Enemy designs are unique and often have interesting animations. I particularly love what happens when you take out a mummy duck. It spins around and unravels, leaving a bear duck behind. And even though I generally like a more linear platformer, I appreciated the different paths and all the hidden items there were to find, including two secret treasures. Diamonds and other items often seem to appear right out of thin air as you go around the levels, so exploration and constant jumping were always being rewarded. And while I didn't like the pogoing at first, the Himalayas level really drives home how important it is to the feel of the game. Here you're going through deep snow, and any attempt to pogo will just make you sink into it. Things slow down considerably and become a lot less fun when you can't use this mechanic. I found the difficulty curve a little bit strange, though technically there's no first level since you can pick any of the five, the first one listed is the Amazon, so that's where I started. I found this level so much harder than the rest of them. Those pesky bees flying at me as I tried to climb vines and pogo across tiny platforms meant I had to play through it a number of times before succeeding. I was a little surprised when I got to Transylvania, the mines, and Himalayas and found everything so much easier. Each level ends with a boss fight, and these can be a little samey. Though the enemies themselves are very visually distinct, beating them is just a matter of pogoing on their heads a number of times. Though I guess if Super Mario Bros. 3 can get away with this, I can't hold it against DuckTales. You do have to hit everything more than three times, though. These are fairly minor complaints I have, and overall, DuckTales is quite good. The real standout level is the moon. Aesthetically, it looks and sounds the best. It's full of cool alien creatures and robots, has a lot of areas with different environments to explore, and it has one of the most well-loved pieces of music on the NES, the moon theme. For fans of the DuckTales animated series or comics, it's also fun to see so many familiar characters in the game, from bosses like Magicka Dispel and Flintheart Glomgold to Scrooge's pals. Launchpad can give Scrooge a ride, Mrs. Beakley offers health replenishing snacks, and Gizmo Duck helps out on the moon. Making sure the characters were done right was a big priority for Disney. Though it was Capcom that was ultimately responsible for the game design, Disney was quite hands-on making sure that DuckTales was properly represented. 
Each time Disney worked with Capcom on a game, they assigned a producer to make sure the game was Disney enough. On DuckTales, this was Darlene Waddington. Darlene had previously been a designer on the Don Bluth game Dragon Slayer, and would go on to produce more Disney Capcom games such as Adventures in the Magic Kingdom and Rescue Rangers. As a Disney producer, she was responsible for things like providing line art, making sure dialogue was well-crafted, and that the games were relatively free of violence. In an interview, Darlene shared that another licensee developer had included a scene of Donald Duck clubbing baby seals in their game. This was the kind of thing Disney would insist on cutting out. The process for producing Disney-licensed games would involve getting a pre-alpha build, and possibly a game spec, and reviewing it to see if any changes were required. In the early days of Disney software, the producer was also responsible for QA, making sure the games were free from bugs, fun to play, and of an appropriate level of challenge for their audience. Darlene has shared that Capcom was a great developer to work with, and that their projects always went smoothly. Getting text and dialogue updates implemented tended to be the biggest hassle, as the developers were more concerned with the gameplay. A prototype of DuckTales from only a few months before the actual release was found to still exist, and was listed on eBay in 2000. The ROM has been dumped and is available online. This is really cool, because it means we get to see the kinds of changes that were made. Many of the changes were mostly aesthetic. In the prototype, it's hamburgers that restore your health, while in the release, it's ice cream cones. In the moon level, the prototype has aliens that kind of resemble snakes. While in release, they use a model similar to one that had actually appeared in the animated series, in the episode where no duck has gone before. And, as in most North American NES games of the time, crucifixes that originally appeared on the coffins in Transylvania were removed, and replaced with the letters R.I.P. There were also a number of changes to text. The original level names were quite generic, things like Jungle and Snow Mountain. These were changed to reflect real places like the Amazon and the Himalayas. Much of the dialogue was improved, and, in one of the best alterations, the text box for dialogue was changed to span the whole top of the screen, rather than try to squish everything into a tiny box on the right. Some things also had to be changed for accuracy. The game originally referred to a Robo-Duck on the moon, when the character's name is actually Gizmo-Duck. Another significant change was to some of the music, though Darlene has said that this was something Capcom did on their own. The Transylvania theme was completely changed, and the original Moon theme was slower, but got sped up in the release version. The funniest thing from the prototype was the ending. In the final screen, Scrooge proclaimed that the greatest treasure is... Dream and Friends? All this hard work paid off, and DuckTales would go on to become Capcom's best-selling game on both the NES and the Game Boy, selling approximately one and a half million copies on each. It received very positive reviews upon release, which praised the graphics, animations, and game design. When there were complaints about it, they tended to point to a lack of difficulty or the short length. In more recent years, DuckTales has been put on innumerable lists of the best NES games. After such a successful first partnership, Disney and Capcom would go on to make more great games together for the NES. Rescue Rangers 1 and 2, Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, Tailspin, The Little Mermaid, Darkwing Duck, and a DuckTales sequel as well. They'd also continue to have a relationship to bring out games on the Super Nintendo, N64, and GameCube, though they worked together less and less as time went on. Nothing lasts forever, but DuckTales marked the start of a very good partnership. That's it, that's the story behind DuckTales, how Disney and Capcom work together, as well as my thoughts on the game after giving it a second chance. Overall, it's quite fun and charming, and probably one of the best adaptations of an existing property on the NES. Let me know in the comments what your favorite Disney Capcom game is. 
Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about a game where a man gets transformed into an ape and has to save a princess. It's Toki. Toki was originally developed by TAD Corporation and released on arcades in Japan in 1989. It was later ported to a multitude of other systems, like the Amiga, Atari, and Commodore 64. I played the NES version, which was ported by Taito and came out in 91. For an early run-and-gun style platformer, Toki includes a lot of text to explain the story. One day, while they're out for a walk, an evil sorcerer captures Toki's girlfriend Miho and turns Toki into an ape. As you start each level, you'll see an overworld map and a block of text that describes Toki's journey. Toki has a good range of moves. He can fire horizontally, diagonally, or vertically depending on what terrain he's on, and he can crouch to avoid enemies or hit foes that appear low to the ground. Through the levels, he'll be climbing vines, swimming, and launching himself to greater heights using a seesaw and a large weight. He can also defeat enemies by jumping on their heads, which is something I didn't realize until a few levels in. Usually when characters rely on shooting, any contact with enemies will cause damage, but that's not the case here. Jumping on enemies will damage them, as well as give extra height to collect otherwise out of reach items. There are a lot of items to collect. Various weapon upgrades will make your shots more powerful or fire in multiple directions. Others will let you shoot fireballs or a stream of flames. If you get a helmet, you'll be impervious to enemy damage for a while, and shoes will let you jump higher. There are also coins and various food items like banana and strawberries, which will give you bonus points for your score. Usually arcade games are designed to be somewhat unfair, so you'll pump them full of as many quarters as possible. So I was surprised by how forgiving Toki was in terms of challenge. Unlike the arcade game, where a single hit will make Toki lose a life, here he can take two hits. You can also gain more heart containers throughout the game to increase your life even more. You start with three lives, but there's at least one extra life item to pick up in each level, and you can gain more by collecting 50 coins or scoring 50,000 points. But the most forgiving and surprising thing was the checkpoints. If you die, you'll always start again very close to where you were. No going back to the start of the level or even a halfway point. Even if you lose all your lives and have to use one of your four continues, you'll start up again right where you left off. Dying hardly sets you back at all. In this aspect, Toki was ahead of its time. I loved this. However, though I enjoy not being punished too much for dying, the overall platforming and shooting difficulty could have been higher. Enemies rarely pose much of a threat, and their attacks are fairly easy to avoid. The only time I found a real platforming challenge was in the final level where you ride a fast-moving minecar. The speed and momentum took a bit to get used to there. The bosses at the end of each level are all quite simple, and though they are visually distinct, all can be beaten with the same strategy. I just stayed at max range and shot continuously while jumping up and down. Some have shields which block damage from certain heights or throw projectiles at you that need to be avoided, but there's not much challenge here. Visually, Toki looks okay, but obviously the NES doesn't live up to the arcade version. Whereas the arcade version has quite detailed sprites and backgrounds with weather effects and flowing waterfalls, the backgrounds in the NES version are all static, and all of the boss fights take place against a blank black background. I do like a lot of the sprites, though. Toki is pretty cute, even more so in the manual, and the enemies he fights are things like penguins, lizards, and baby dinosaurs. The one thing I found most visually impressive was how Toki and Miho look in the game's opening. The NES isn't great at making characters that look human, but these two look pretty good, for the few seconds they're on screen at least. As for the bosses, the first boss is an extremely racist caricature, which kind of puts a damper on the rest of the game for me. 
It's too bad they started out like this because some of the other boss designs are quite interesting. I liked the Jade Elephant at the end of Stage 4, and the Stage 5 boss, the semi-invisible giant Bashtar, is very cool looking. All that's visible of him is his hands, feet, and heart, and you need to hit his heart to defeat him. The bosses all have a health meter which will let you know how you're doing in the fight. The music is not very impressive. While there are different tracks for the bosses and map screens, each stage has the same music, and I found myself getting pretty tired of it. There is a two-player mode in Toki, but it's very basic. You just take turns playing through the game, and things look exactly the same for both players. Toki is a mediocre NES game. Though I liked the forgiving checkpoints, overall it was a little too easy and very short. Give it a try if you're looking for a quick one, but there are much better NES games out there. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about an NES game that I had never heard of until I found it sitting on the NES shelf the other day. Dare I call it a hidden gem? It's Isolated Warrior. Isolated Warrior was released on the NES in 1991. It was developed by Kid, who also made games such as G.I. Joe, Kickmaster, and Rekka. It's a scrolling shooter with an isometric perspective and some platforming elements, making it different from anything else I've played on the system. You play Max Maverick, the only survivor of a group of special forces taking on an alien invasion alone. He is an isolated warrior. I had no idea what to expect when first putting the cartridge in the system, and I was excited to find it played like a scrolling shooter, but something more akin to Gunsmoke than Gradius. Max is usually grounded as opposed to flying. There are a few twists, as Max can jump over enemies, projectile, and dangerous parts of each level. The isometric view also makes the game stand out. There are some isometric games on the NES, things like Marble Madness, Solstice, and The Immortal, but none are quite like this. Many shoot-em-up conventions are used. You can choose between two different weapon types, either a focusing shot that shoots straight ahead and can be powered up to also shoot behind you, or a spreading shot that can go in up to five directions. You can also use bombs, which you can throw while jumping, and will travel outwards in up to eight directions. Power-ups, which drop from defeated enemies, are abundant. You can get them for both weapon types as well as your bombs. There are also objects that increase your speed, recover some of your life bar, or give you a barrier. The barrier will absorb five hits, and is the thing you really don't want to miss picking up. There are also items that give you more bombs or bonus points. Something that I really liked, which was a departure from usual shooter design, was that you can switch between the two weapon types at will. Picking up power-ups doesn't automatically switch what weapon you have equipped, so you can get everything without it messing up your strategy. Max can get up to 10 life points, but he starts each level with only 5. I do like that the game doesn't have one-hit kills, but life points can disappear fast, especially if you run into an enemy or one spawns on top of you and you don't notice immediately. You have three lives to work with, though you can gain more by reaching certain point levels or grabbing very elusive one-ups. I only saw one of these during the course of my entire game. If you lose all your lives, you can continue. Isolated Warrior is fairly forgiving about deaths, for an NES game. There are checkpoints throughout the levels, and you don't lose all of your weapon power when you die. The weapon type you have equipped when you die is affected, but the other retains the power it had. This is nice, as in most shooters, going back to the base weapon level can really make things difficult. Letting you keep the power level of the unequipped weapon gives you an actual chance to be successful after a death. Overall, I found the game had a good difficulty curve. It starts out quite manageable while you learn the mechanics, then more and more gets thrown at you as you progress. By the end, the enemies are abundant, their movement's more erratic, and there are less safe spaces to stand. 
The game has seven stages, but in order to get to the seventh and see the true ending, you can't use any continues. Otherwise, it will end after stage six. When you finish each stage, you're given a code that you can use to skip right back there next time. To keep things interesting, your method of movement changes up in some levels. While you're usually walking, on stage two, you use a hover pack. The way Max is carrying his weapon here almost makes it look like he's riding a broom. Isolated Witch, now that's a game I would play. On stage four, you ride a motorcycle, which speeds things up considerably. At times, it gets so quick that I found it very difficult to properly line up my shots on enemies or pick up any items before they scrolled out of reach. The platforming elements, though a welcome novelty, don't always work that well and do result in some of the most frustrating moments in the game. It is really fun to be able to jump over enemies, and I feel like a badass when I somersault through the air while throwing a bomb and laying waste to everything on screen. However, when it comes to jumping over pits, which will kill you if you fall into them, the jumping doesn't feel great. There's an invisible barrier at the top of the screen, and it sometimes got me killed. The motorcycle level in particular has a ton of jumping, and I found I needed to concentrate entirely on that rather than enemies or items, and it ended up being more frustrating than fun. Isolated Warrior isn't the best looking NES game. There's an overuse of bright green, red, and magenta, and I found it quite gaudy. Most of the level's primary colors are far too saturated and intense, making it difficult to find and focus on what's actually important. Enemy designs are generally well done, if not particularly memorable. There are a lot of slightly different looking robots, artillery, and drones, and some things I really can't identify. There are a couple standouts. The second stage boss looks like a huge waterborne transformer with the face of an old man. And the third stage boss has the best design. It's a floating exposed brain with tentacles, and it shoots mini brains at you. The music is very good. The first few tracks especially are very upbeat and suit the gameplay well. An addition I really liked was scenes between each level, which expanded the story. It was just the right amount of text to give the game a little flavor, but never felt like it was slowing things down. There are also some secrets to find, though I didn't find any myself until a few stages in. If you drop a bomb at certain points, a warp area will open up that shows a little scene and benefits you in some way. It can refill your health or give you extra weapon power. Things like this always manage to keep me on my toes, and I really appreciate that. It's been a while since I've been surprised by an NES game, and though Isolated Warrior definitely has some jank to it, the novelty of it really got me through the weaker parts. I ended up having a lot of fun with it, and I recommend it to anyone who likes shoot 'em ups or run and guns and is looking for something a little different. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about an arcade game that takes more than a few cues from Pac-Man. It's Trog. Trog was originally developed by Midway and released in arcades in 1990. It was ported to the NES by Visual Concepts and also ported to DOS. I played the NES version, though I will compare it a bit to the original arcade game. So what's the story here? In the land of Og, there are one-eyed cavemen called Trogs, short for troglodytes, and there are Dynomites. You play a Dynomite whose goal is to steal eggs while avoiding the Trogs, who want to eat you. Over a series of 50 stages, you'll be challenged to gather every egg on screen, then make your way to the exit but there will be obstacles. Trogs will spawn from holes in the ground, and though they're not particularly clever about chasing you, if you get surrounded or caught off guard, they can knock you out. When this happens, they'll whip out a knife and fork and literally eat the meat off your bones. I was a little taken aback the first time I saw this happen. You're not helpless though, as you can take out Trogs by punching them using the A or B button. 
Punching and changing the direction of your constantly moving dino are the only controls available to you. Trogs are not the only danger you'll face. In many levels, you can fall off the edge into water or lava, which will cost you a life. It's not terribly obvious which edges you can fall off, especially for those at the edges of the screen. Sometimes an invisible barrier seemed to keep me from falling, and sometimes I had no such luck. Trogs can also create fires which will burn you if you run over them, or tar pits that you'll drown in, but these things happen rather infrequently. You get three lives and three continues to complete the game, and can gain more lives by reaching certain scores. I do like that after losing a life, you continue right from where you were and get to keep any eggs you've already collected in a level rather than having to start over. There are also a number of items you can pick up that affect you in some way. Red flowers make you faster, while blue mushrooms make you slower. Horseshoes give you temporary protection, hot tamales let you shoot fireballs, and ice cubes will freeze any enemies on screen. The big power-up is a pineapple, which turns you into a large T-Rex, allowing you to devour any trogs who have the misfortune of being in your path, and preventing you from falling off ledges. Though there are a few gameplay differences, Trog is still very similar in concept to Pac-Man. But rather than play a yellow pizza with a slice missing, what is Pac-Man supposed to be anyway? You get to play as a dinosaur named Bloop, which is an obvious improvement. I'm a bit of a sucker for a dinosaur theme, and some of the animations and transitions between stages are what stand out to me most about the game. I love the effect when you turn into a T-Rex, and it's fun to turn the tables on the trog and eat them. The dino dance that happens when you complete each stage is fun and adorable. Unfortunately, the rest of the game's look and sound is not overly impressive and does get redundant. While the levels do change up a bit, some are themed after tropical islands, some are icy, some fiery, there's not a whole lot of variations and the layouts do start repeating. Likewise, the entire game soundtrack is only 8 or 9 minutes long, so you'll hear that repeating a lot too. There are really only a couple new mechanics introduced over the course of the game. The first is teleportation chambers. If you enter a doorway, you'll come out a different, connected one. Then there are catapults, which will bounce you to a different part of the screen. Unfortunately, when you get the ability to bounce, so do the trogs. If a trog lands on you, it'll kill you. But if you land on a trog, it will also kill you. The catapults are rather annoying in their randomness and often leave you open to attack. I found these were the major source of difficulty, and as you progress you'll also face a greater amount of trogs who can move faster and can start throwing wheels at you. Occasionally you'll be treated to a bonus stage where you'll be tasked with killing as many trogs as possible in a limited amount of time. These are mostly just a way to boost your score. One other nice bonus is that there is a way to warp forward by three stages. At the start of each stage, one of the eggs on screen will glimmer momentarily. If you collect this egg last, a warp portal will open up. However, it will only work if you get through the stage in a single life. The game's start screen makes it look like there are multiple difficulty levels, but as far as I could tell, it's really just a selection of which stage to start at. Nothing else seemed different when choosing Advanced or Expert rather than Easy. You can play Trog with a second player who will take control of a dino named Spike. In this mode, you're competing to collect all the eggs that match your dino's color and make it to the exit first. In the original arcade game, you can play with up to four players rather than just two. It also boasts much more advanced graphics, which use a claymation look, making it very visually distinct. Trog was not originally developed as a Pac-Man-style maze game. It was supposed to be more of a strategy game, where rather than directly control the dino, you laid down bones to block off paths and direct it where you wanted. However, people who played it did not find it fun, and the game was almost cancelled. The developers decided to use the sprites and levels they had created and refashion it into the game it became.
Trog is a decent arcade port. I really like the sprites and animations, though the gameplay and levels start to feel repetitive long before its 50 stages are done. It's fun, but only for a limited time. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about a game that's a bit obscure and a bit odd. It's City Connection. City Connection was developed by Jalico in 1985. It was originally an arcade game, but got ported to the NES in North America in 1988, which is the version I'm reviewing. This is one of those games where, if you don't read the manual first, it's not entirely clear what's going on. In my first go, without knowing anything about it, I quickly figured out that I could pick up cans and shoot them at cop cars. The road was also changing colors as I drove over it, though I wasn't really sure why. After a minute, a pig with a flag showed up, and based on what I had been doing so far, I thought I should hit it. But that made me lose a life. According to the game manual, what's actually going on is that you've broken into an exclusive paint store in New York City, and are now leaking paint all over, which is why the roads are turning white as you drive over them. There are multiple levels of roads that you can jump or fall to. And the pig? Apparently that's a cat, and you need to avoid it. I'm not sure that the makers of this game have ever seen a cat before. The goal is to cover every single tile of road, while avoiding the cops, in order to move on to the next city, where your paint spree will continue. There are a total of six cities to visit. New York, London, Paris, Frankfurt, New Delhi, and Tokyo. There's no real ending to the game. When I finished the Tokyo level, it took me back to New York City, though the configuration of the roads had changed a bit. It seems this is more of a pure arcade score-chasing game, though there's no high score screen, which seems like a bit of an oversight. The gameplay is very simple. You just drive. You can make quick 180 degree turns to avoid things, or jump to a higher level by hitting up plus A. You can speed up or slow down your car, but can never stop. The police cars which litter each level go slower than you, but also often fall from higher levels onto your car. You can get them out of the way by shooting the oil cans you pick up with B, and while they're spinning out, you can ram them to send them off the road. If you hit them when they're not spinning, or if they hit you, you lose a life, but you can gain extras every 25,000 points. The pig cats can't be hit, and you need to avoid those by turning around or jumping over them. The manual also mentions spikes that will start appearing on the road if you stay on one level for too long, but I never saw them. If an obstacle appears in front of you, you can turn around until it scrolls off screen and it'll be gone if you turn back again. This is a strategy that got used a lot. Occasionally, you'll see balloons, and if you collect three of these, you'll get warped randomly to another location. City Connection does start to get rather repetitive, and like most NES ports of arcade games, this one doesn't look nearly as nice as the original. Besides the arcade version just generally looking more colorful and detailed with better animations, there are some other differences between the versions. In the original Japanese arcade, you played a blue-haired anime girl named Clarice. Depending on where you look, she's either traveling the world just to say she did it, or is looking for the perfect man. I'm not sure why either draws police attention. In the NES version, she's been replaced by a smug-looking blonde dude who obviously has a penchant for paint. The arcade version also has 12 stages rather than 6, and allows you to visit more places like Australia, Egypt, and Easter Island. It also has different music for each stage, while the NES only has three different tracks, none of which are very good. The arcade version also has a much better idea of what a cat looks like. City Connection on NES starts wearing out its welcome rather quickly, the music gets repetitive, and the levels, even though the backgrounds are different, all play pretty much the same. 
Obstacles seem to come out of nowhere at times, especially those darn pig cats. You need to be fairly active with the controls, making frequent turns and jumping between levels in order to stay alive. The only real change as you progress is the configuration of the roads, which become more difficult to travel between. I do question the draw of this trip across the world. All these cities seem to have to offer is excessive numbers of police and poorly thought out roads. If they defunded police and diverted some of that budget to things like infrastructure, a better time would be had by all. City Connection is an interesting game because it's unlike most others I've played, but it didn't keep my attention for long. I can't expect too much, given that it was originally a 1985 arcade game, but the experience of playing it on NES at home is a little lacking. The arcade version was ported to PS4 and Switch fairly recently, but unless you can get it for really cheap, I wouldn't particularly recommend it. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today, I'm talking about something that's just joined the ranks of my favorite Nintendo games. It's Super Spy Hunter. Super Spy Hunter was developed by Sunsoft and released on NES in 1992. It's a vehicular combat game where you follow a track, avoid obstacles, and take out enemies. There is a story in the manual about being the CIA's last line of defense against terrorists who threatened to plunge the world into chaos, but none of this is even hinted at in-game. You just drive and shoot. This is a game I was not familiar with, but was pleasantly surprised by. At first, it seems like a rather straightforward racing-type game, and it actually reminded me a lot of the Autopia level from Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. But it soon became clear that this was much more complex and impressive. For one thing, your car can shoot in multiple directions. There's a two-pronged cannon atop your car, and by holding down A, you can change the angles at which they point, whether it's straight ahead, to the sides, or even behind you. Whatever best suits the current attack pattern of enemy vehicles which are trying to ram into you. Being hit by vehicles doesn't do damage on its own, but hitting the walls will hurt you, and going off the road entirely will make you lose a life. You start out with 4 health and 5 lives, but can get more of both. Fairly often, you'll come across weapon vehicles, which look like transport trucks that have various power-ups for you. The red trucks can give you extra life, up to a total of 12 health, faster firing speed, or greater power. There's also a cannon control pickup, which will change the cannons atop your car to automatically point in the direction of the closest threats. This one is really useful, as the manual controls are a little on the slow side. The blue weapon trucks give you bonuses like a one-time ability to bomb everything on screen, or to sprout spikes from your wheels that will damage anything that gets close. You can also get a 1-up or refill your life bar. One of the coolest things about Super Spy Hunter is that you're not always driving a car. At times, you're in a boat or even a plane, and that changes things up considerably. In the game's fifth stage, you start out driving a boat, avoiding naval mines which can kill you instantly. Then you transition to driving and have to avoid flaming oil cans falling off the backs of trucks. Then you change into a plane and face off against enemies attacking from both land and sea. There are six stages in all, and each ends in a boss fight. The bosses all look and play quite differently. Some are like your basic shoot 'em up bosses, where you have to avoid a ton of projectiles while shooting at a weak point. While others will telegraph instant kill attacks, and you need to react quickly to avoid them. What makes them extra challenging is the fact that most bosses can move around a lot, and hitting the walls hurts you. Things can be going really well, but then the boss makes a move and pins you against a wall, and things go downhill fast. The fourth stage boss in particular was a real challenge that took many, many attempts, and I was none too pleased when I had to face it a second time at the end. When you die, you lose some of your power-ups and life bar, which makes things much harder, but there are fairly forgiving checkpoints for an NES game. 
The presentation of Super Spy Hunter is impressive. Sunsoft's music is great, as usual, and there are some very cool effects used in the levels. As a game that came out late in the NES lifecycle, the developers knew how to make the most of the technology. The first thing that struck me, less than a minute in, was this really cool cornering effect that gives the impression of the game having much more dimension than it actually does. While I don't find the vehicle sprites all that interesting to look at, I love the level design and effects used. A roadway is the main environment that you're traveling on, but each stage has at least one or two different mechanics or effects mixed in. In stage one, there's a segment where your car drives in the water and has to make a series of jumps on narrow pathways. There's also a swaying suspension bridge to race across. In stage two, you drive through a desert with large patches of quicksand that will pull you in if you get too close. It rains in stage three, making the road slippery. You also jump and soar through the air and get to watch the road reappear underneath you as you descend. It's all just really well done and a lot of fun to play. I also really like that at times road signs will appear to let you know about what's coming up ahead whether it's a jump, a corner, or even a place you need to slow right down to traverse a precarious route. There are still a few places where you can die due to not knowing exactly how to move, but for the most part, this isn't a game you need to memorize in order to be successful. If I had to list some negatives of the game, one would be that some sections feel like they go on a little too long. There's one kind of dull part in Stage 3, and in Stage 5, before facing the final boss, you get an easy run of flying where you can pick up tons of power-ups. This sounds great, but in practice, it's over a minute of the exact same things flying at you with no challenge or change. There's also some flicker and slow down, but that's really to be expected given the size of some bosses and the amount of things on screen at once. Overall, it's an incredibly fun game, and the soundtrack just adds to the excitement. Tracks sample the Peter Gunn theme, which is the definitive spy music, and everything is incredibly upbeat with a great bassy sound. It's perfect 8-bit driving music. Super Spy Hunter was preceded by Spy Hunter, but it's not exactly a direct sequel. Spy Hunter was a 1983 arcade game by Bally Midway. It was ported to the NES by Sunsoft in 1987. While the games certainly look similar at first glance, the original is much less interesting. There are no power-ups, no changing vehicles, no discrete stages or boss fights. You just play until you get a game over or you start seeing the same backgrounds over again. The sound effects are also quite grating. The actual sequel to Spy Hunter was Spy Hunter 2, which only came out in arcades in 1987 and never gained much popularity. Sunsoft released this game as Battle Formula for the Famicom in Japan, and while it was clearly influenced by Spy Hunter, it wasn't officially related. However, when it came time to release in North America, Sunsoft got the rights to the name from Bally Midway and Super Spy Hunter was born. The Spy Hunter series received a reboot on the sixth generation of consoles in the early 2000s, and then another reboot on handhelds in 2012. I think this little NES outlier is likely the best of the bunch, though. Super Spy Hunter is a great NES game. It's challenging, but fair, and the variation in level design really makes it stand out. The music is so good that I'd listen to it outside of playing the game, and overall it was just a really good time. I highly recommend checking this one out. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about a shooter that has some imagery that you don't usually see on the NES. It's Abadox. Abadox was developed by Natsume and released for NES in North America in 1990. It's a scrolling shooter where you face off against a number of gross-looking organic enemies as you try to save your planet and a princess. An alien life form called Parasitus has swallowed your home planet of Abadox and now threatens the rest of the galaxy. 
You need to blast your way into the creature's body, make your way to its core, and destroy it. Abadox will probably remind Shoot 'em Up fans a lot of Konami's Life Force, or Salamander as it was known in Japan. The story is similar, as are some backgrounds and enemies. And they both alternate between horizontal and vertical scrolling. However, in Abadox, the vertical stages have you flying downwards rather than up the screen, which is a cool change that also makes sense considering you're traveling down to the center of this huge creature. Your character, 2nd Lieutenant Nazal, floats through each level, shooting enemies and picking up various power capsules. You can increase your speed, gain barriers that will absorb hits for you, or get missiles that will fire extra projectiles. There are also a few different main weapons to get and power up. There's a tri-beam that shoots in three directions, a star beam which shoots in five, and a Pandora gun that shoots big rings of energy. In the vertical levels, you can also get a very powerful laser gun. The power-ups are set, and you can memorize which enemies they drop from as you go. Abadox does not have auto-fire, which is a design decision I'm never really a fan of. My hands get tired. In an attempt to stave off the comments I get any time I complain about a lack of auto-fire, many NES games had auto-fire at this point. Life Force and Xanak both had it, and they were a couple years before this. Guardian Legend had it. It was not a technical limitation. Through Abadox's six stages, you travel from the surface of Parasitus, down its throat, through its nerves, intestines, and stomach. Each stage has both a mid-boss and a final boss. The backgrounds and enemies you face are the most unique part of the game. Full gross-out body horror is definitely not something you see much on the NES. Enemies will include poisonous spores, nerves, and skeletal fish. Not everything makes the most sense, at one point you fight a robot boss, but everything has a similar and kind of spooky feel to it. The bosses are where the most repellent designs are, and I'm not saying repellent in a bad way, they're very well designed. The first one has two eyeballs floating around on their stalks that you need to battle. The third stage has you up against a grotesque intestinal creature with an eyeball sticking out of its torso. There are actually a lot of eyeballs in this game, and they're usually a weak spot. The most unique and disturbing boss is the elongated stomach of Parasitus. You travel down a corridor beside the stomach, shooting bits of it as you go and being threatened by spikes. The soundtrack is pretty good, sort of your typical electronic shoot 'em up music. The starting theme is a bit on the spooky side, and I wish that feeling had continued a bit more throughout the rest of the stage themes. I would have loved to have it really go all in on the horror. Regardless, it's a decent soundtrack, composed by Kiyohiro Sada, who also worked on Contra. The interesting visuals and the novelty of a horror-themed NES shoot-'em-up are what make Abadox worth a look. However, when it comes to gameplay, I do have some complaints. I found the difficulty of this game was wildly inconsistent. You get killed in one hit, which obviously makes it quite a challenge. You do get unlimited continues, but when you start up again with no power-ups, things are almost impossible. The barriers that you can pick up to float around you and absorb hits are not the most reliable. They really need to come directly between you and a projectile in order to save you, and I died a few times despite being surrounded by them. The hit detection is also not the most reliable. I'd sometimes be sure that I was dead because I had hit an object, but I'd pass by without incident. And other times, when I thought I was safe, I'd end up dying. The controls are on the stiffer side. This wasn't an issue in the more open corridors, but you often have to go through very tight passages, and I never felt like I had enough control to do it reliably. I probably hit more walls than enemies or projectiles throughout the game. And then there's the bosses. While initially they look quite difficult, with dozens of projectiles being thrown at you, most have a very easy way to exploit them. There are safe places on many of the fights where you can just stand still and spam attacks until they die. 
Even the final boss has a weak point that lets you take it out before the fight has really even started. It's just a bit disappointing and uneven that after the very difficult corridors in each level, most of the bosses are kind of pushovers once you spot the trick to them. There's also a lot of slowdown at some points when many things are on screen at once. This is normal for NES, but at times it got quite bad and made the game feel laggy and like I couldn't shoot fast enough. The game ends in a novel way, though also in the same way as Life Force. There are no enemies in the final zone, and instead, you need to navigate around obstacles while the game continually speeds up. This was an interesting and very challenging ending. I had fun with Abadox even if I had a lot of criticisms of it. It's just not as smooth feeling as my favorite shmups, and the tight corridors and one-hit kills could make things very frustrating. However, I think Abadox is worth a play if you like shoot-'em-ups or gross things. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about video games. Today I'm talking about a late-release game that switches things up constantly and looks fantastic. It's Zen Intergalactic Ninja. Zen Intergalactic Ninja was developed by Konami and released on NES in 1993. A Game Boy version released at the same time. Zen is based on a comic book character of the same name. He's an alien that was raised by the Masters of Ohm, who trained him to be a mercenary ninja. In the game, Zen is fighting against Lord Contaminus and his toxic henchmen, who are out to destroy the Earth with pollution. The levels in Zen take place in either a side-scrolling or isometric view, and his abilities in each are slightly different. You can always jab with your photon stick to damage enemies. In side view, you can hook an enemy with the staff and slam them over your head. You can also hang from or climb on pipes, and you can do a rather energetic wall jump. In isometric view, you can hook enemies, spin them around, and toss them. You can also do jump attacks or long jumps by tapping B while in the air. You have a fairly large health bar, and if it's getting low, you can press select to meditate and regenerate. However, you can only do this a limited number of times, indicated in the bottom right of the screen. In the game's start menu, you can choose your difficulty as well as how many lives you start with. I played on normal, but tried out a couple levels on both easy and difficult, and I honestly didn't notice much of a difference. At the beginning, you're presented with a map screen, allowing you to choose between four stages. No matter which you pick, it will start with a description from the Masters of Ohm, telling you your objective and a little scene of Zen entering the location. This is a bit of an odd one to review. The game changes so much from stage to stage that I think I'm just gonna have to talk about all of them. The Toxic Factory is one of the game's isometric levels. Here, Zen just needs to escape before the timer runs out. He'll need to avoid obstacles and fight some robots, but the real challenge is the platforming section. You'll have to traverse a series of platforms above a bottomless void. Some are treadmills, some move around, and sometimes you'll have a robot arm looming above you, threatening to pluck you up and drop you to your death. This was the most challenging of the four stages, partially because it was the first one I played, but also because isometric platforming is tough. The level saving grace is that Zen has a very obvious shadow which you can line up with the platforms as you descend from your jumps. Still though, accidents happen. There's also a very strange segment where you need to battle a fence for a hole in the ground, and if it pushes you out, you get smushed. The level ends in a boss fight against Smogger, who can turn into smoke and throw fireballs at you. In the Slicks on Oil rig, you have to rescue people trapped on the burning rig. This is a side-scrolling level, and it's mostly about avoiding fire damage that is raining from above, as well as small oil enemies, while finding fire extinguishers and all the trapped people. You press up plus B to put out fires, and are making your way steadily upwards as you go. In the end, you fight Oil Slick, who attempts to cover you in the stuff. 
I liked the concept of this level and how it was more about saving people than fighting things. Runaway Railcar is a minecart level that switches between side and isometric views. You have to jump over gaps in the track, fight enemies who are also in carts, and jump over or destroy things that get in your way. You also need to be on the lookout for track switches. The speed on this level is incredible. At times my eyes had trouble focusing on what was going on. The boss here is Garbage Man, and he likes to throw garbage at you. Lastly, there's the Acid Rain Forest. The ultimate goal is to fight the boss, Sulfura, at the top of the trees. While you're doing this, Acid Rain is damaging the flowers below, and if they get hurt, you get hurt. You'll need to take breaks from the fight to go back down and smack the flowers with your photon stick to revive them. This level looks really cool, but winds up being incredibly short once you figure out what you need to do. I love the variation in this game. Every environment looks distinct and gives you something unique to do. And we're not even done yet, as after each of the main stages, there's another little bonus level. Keeping with the game's environmental theme, there's a recycling bonus stage. You need to hit items falling from the sky into the recycler. If you get six of each type of item, you can get a bonus, like increasing your maximum health, getting an extra life, a shield, or another use of your healing meditation ability. A couple areas get very vertical. One has you wall jumping in a chase for a kidnapped boy who you need to rescue. Another has you falling through a cavern, having to dodge enemies and platforms while a spiked ceiling falls after you, threatening to crush you. This one was reminiscent of Quick Man's level from Mega Man 2. When you're done with all of this, you'll be faced with four boss fights in a row. First, there's a slime monster who spits frogs at you. This is the most annoying part of the game by far, as the boss will pop up randomly in a number of different spots and will spawn frogs. It can take forever to whittle his health down because it's not always possible to reach him when he appears. And the frogs are very hard to hit. The next boss is an amalgamation of scrap metal and is not too interesting or different from the other isometric bosses. It's the last two bosses that are the real standouts. First, you'll need to fight a clone of yourself in a lab, and this is definitely the most difficult of all the boss fights. It has the exact same abilities as you do, including the ability to heal back up to full. Twice. Finally, you fight Lord Contaminus himself. There's a quick pre-fight in his throne room, then you battle in space, in orbit above the Earth. In this fight, you need to not only work at killing Contaminus, who can also heal himself up to full multiple times, but also take out the little pods he spawns. If you don't, they'll plummet to the Earth, polluting it and doing harm. You can watch the planet turn red as it's damaged, and if too many get by, you lose the fight. I love boss fights that take place in space, and this one is pretty epic. Zen was made near the end of the NES life cycle, and the developers at Konami knew what they were doing. The result is one of the best looking games I've seen on the system. The sprites are large and detailed, with great animations. Oil Slick is particularly impressive with how he oozes into a puddle of oil, then reforms. And all of Zen's abilities are impressive to look at. The use of color is good, and I especially like the Acid Rainforest. It's very detailed and lush, with so many different kinds of surfaces. Branches to hang on, grass to bounce off, and acid clouds threatening you at every turn. Every stage is as unique in its visual design and color palette as it is in its gameplay. The music is really great too. Very energetic and fitting of what you're doing in the game. I also really like the sound effects and little flourishes when you beat a boss or finish a stage. It's a fairly short game, but things change up so much that it doesn't really feel like it. My biggest complaint is an uneven difficulty curve. In some ways, the game is quite forgiving. You have a lot of health, and the ability to self-heal is great. 
just don't be like me and use all of your healing on early bosses and have nothing left for the end. You can gain extra lives, more health, and shields in a few places throughout the game which help out as well. But there are some areas, many in the factory level, where deaths feel unavoidable and cheap. And when bosses start using your self-healing trick themselves, it is rather annoying. The fight against your clone, while cool to watch, just feels so much more difficult than anything else in the game. The Game Boy version of Zen has the same general concept, but plays completely differently. It's a straightforward side-scroller, and Zen's photon stick can shoot projectiles as well as be used for melee attacks. Zen Intergalactic Ninja is a really fun game with a ton of variety in its levels and gameplay. I love how many of the stages are more focused on objectives than on platforming or combat, and it's one of the best looking games on the NES. I highly recommend giving this one a shot if you haven't played it yet. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today I'm talking about another one of those late release NES games that I can't seem to get enough of. It's Wacky Races. Wacky Races is a platformer that was developed by Atlas and released for NES in North America in 1992. Based on the 1968 Hanna-Barbera cartoon, which ran for only one season, you play Muttley, sidekick to the villainous Dick Dastardly, and you're constantly trying to get him out of trouble. As the game opens up, you're shown three different areas with some very odd names. Hip Hop, Splish Splash, and Go Go America. The first level takes place in a forest full of log cabins and is a very easy introduction to the game. Muttley's main attack to fight back against the insects, snails, and plants you'll face is a very short range bite. It can do the job, but it's not ideal. Luckily, you can get access to four other abilities, which are showcased at the bottom of the screen. Picking up bones lets you use them. You can activate whichever one is currently highlighted with Select. The first is Bomb, which allows Muttley to throw bombs at enemies, a much more efficient way of taking them out than biting. The next is Sonic Bark, another ranged attack which travels in a straight line rather than in an arc. Wing allows Muttley to float by wagging his tail as he descends from jumps, and the heart will give you one extra hit point, up to a maximum of six, as well as refill your health. You can also collect diamonds, 100 of which will give you an extra life. Wacky Races is not a long game. There are 10 levels, each of which ends in a boss fight, and they're all fairly easy. Each level, whether you're in a castle, downtown, or a land made of cake, plays similarly. There are a variety of enemies that threaten you, and the occasional pit to fall in which will instantly kill you. There are only two levels which feel a bit different. The Ice Village, as you can probably guess, has slippery surfaces which adds a bit of challenge. There's also an ocean level, the physics of which feels nothing like any underwater level I've ever played. Muttley is oddly buoyant, but as long as you constantly press in the direction you want to go, this doesn't impact you much. The bosses are also very similar. They're all in vehicles, likely a reference to the game's source material, and while they look different, they all do pretty much the same thing. They follow a path around the screen and can damage you if they hit you. In the second phase of their fights, they'll also throw some projectiles. The environments and enemy designs switch up often enough that things don't get boring, but mechanically, nothing changes. Though the manual says that the levels get harder when you go from course to course, I didn't really find this to be true. I was flush with extra lives, and though the bosses could take an attempt or two to get the pattern down, the levels themselves were quite easy. Given the late release date on this game, I kind of expected it to look better. It looks fine, just simple. Atlas wasn't pushing any technical limitations here. The music is likewise fine. It's fun and cartoony, but not overly memorable. 
Muttley does have some cute animations, like his frequent snickering, and if you let him idle for too long, he'll go to sleep. I also like the cartoon cutscenes between the worlds. I think it was a missed opportunity to not put any actual racing in a game called Wacky Races. Mixing things up by throwing in a racing level at the end of each world could have really elevated this game above what is a very standard cartoon platformer. In the cartoon, Dick Dastardly and Muttley race around in a purple flying rocket-powered car and are constantly trying to trap or sabotage other racers, which usually backfires on them. I think a lot of fun could have been had with this concept. When most people think of classic NES games based on existing IPs, they probably think of the Disney Capcom games. Hanna-Barbera did try to hang in there, though. Taito made a handful of games based on their cartoons. The Flintstones, Rescue of Dino and Hoppy, and Surprise at Dinosaur Peak, also The Jetsons, Cogswell's Caper. They're decent games. I actually quite like Surprise at Dinosaur Peak. It's not remotely worth the price it fetches now, as most aren't, but it's worth finding another way to play. The Jetsons game even kind of plays like the Rescue Rangers games, with its focus on throwing boxes at enemies. Maybe the Hanna-Barbera games didn't do as well because the cartoons they were based on were so much older. They're all from the 60s, as opposed to the newer and more exciting Disney Afternoon cartoons. Or maybe it was because all of the games released well after the Super Nintendo came out and people had moved on. Or maybe they just weren't quite as good. Wacky Races is fine. It controls well, and I did have some fun with it, but all ten levels feel pretty much the same. I have no problem with easy games. Sometimes it's nice to play something on the NES that isn't punishingly difficult. There's just not a lot to make this one stand out from all the other platformers out there. And they really squandered the concept of the show the game's based on by not including any vehicle sections. The game is worth a try, but if you don't play it, you're not missing out on too much. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. I hope you like pinball because today I'm talking about Pinball Quest. Pinball Quest was developed by TOS and released for the NES in North America in 1990. It bills itself as the world's first pinball fantasy, and offers three different pinball tables to play on, alone or with up to three other players, as well as an RPG mode that has a story, set levels, boss fights, and even some upgrades to buy. The controls are quite simple, and the physics of the ball are somewhat questionable. Hitting left on the D-pad controls your left flipper, while A moves the right. You can also tilt or shake the table with B to try to get the ball to change its course. One thing that makes this game a little more interesting is that you also need to manually move your flippers between available spots with up and down on the D-pad. The first pinball table you can choose is Pop Pop. This is sports themed and has bowling pins for you to knock down and a pool table the ball can enter for extra points. This is a pretty fun table to play with lots of things going on. Next is Viva Golf, which is my least favorite of the three. The bumpers are set up in an odd way and there's a very annoying water trap. The last table is Circus. This has a slot machine for extra points as well as to give access to a special minigame. In the minigame, you need to hit the lions that are chasing a woman around with a ball, but don't hit her or she'll get mad. But it's the RPG mode that really makes this game interesting. It's cool to have a pinball game that has an end state, a purpose other than a high score. You play the little silver pinball itself and are told by a ghost in the game's starting graveyard level that the princess has been captured and you need to save her. The six pinball tables you'll travel to are all quite different, and besides the usual pinball mechanics, also have monsters to defeat and objectives to complete to open up the way to the next level. You damage monsters by hitting them, and your attack power, indicated in the bottom left of the screen, increases as you defeat them. 
Taking out the skeletons in this level spawns the boss, which is the key to making it to the next table. In between levels, there's a shop where you can buy various upgrades that can make playing a bit easier. There are four different stoppers which can be placed to the left, right, or center, and can last from a single hit to the whole level. The two different flippers, Strong and Devil, increase your damage done, but the Devil flippers can also just stop working sometimes. If you don't have enough gold, you can try to steal. This might end up in your favor, filling your four inventory slots with random upgrades, or it could end in you getting beat up and having half your money taken. You need to manually use your upgrades, which is something I didn't realize until a ways in, making everything much harder for myself. When you get to the level you want to use them, pressing select will open your inventory and you can select and place the things you want to use. Instead of points, you gain gold for defeating enemies and hitting bumpers. For some reason, you can only see how much gold you have while you have your inventory open or are in the shop. I'm not sure why they wouldn't have just put this on the default UI so you could see it at all times. Once you've finished with the shop, you move on to level 2. Here you need to take out some demon bumpers that block your way through the middle of a table and defeat a witch with her demon dogs. I was a little disappointed to find out from the manual that this was a witch, and not, as I assumed, the pinball wizard. Also, why does the witch have dogs instead of cats? This table is decent, not overly challenging, and once you're done, you get another chance at upgrades in the store. The third table is pretty cute. There are two little goblins wandering around in the bottom of the screen, and hitting the ball to one of them will have them walk over and deposit it in a cart, which takes it to the top of the table. Though sometimes being hit by the ball makes them mad, and they'll just chuck it back at you. Now you'll have to take out nine stationary goblin guards before you can fight the Goblin King. No, not that one, sadly. The fourth table has turtles and knights, a winning combination. This one is really amusing while playing through your first ball, but extremely tedious on subsequent plays. You need to get up a ramp which then launches your ball into the Wheel of Luck. Sometimes it will get blocked by a turtle, sometimes it will shoot you back to the start, but what you want is for it to take you to the next section. Here, there are six knights which activate one by one, and you need to defeat them all to open up the level exit. If your ball falls through at any point, it will go to a river and be picked up by a passing boat and return to you. This sequence takes a very long time, and I found myself frustratedly exclaiming, oh my god, get on with it, at my television screen a lot. Table 5 is a nice reprieve. It's split into three horizontal sections, and your goal is to get over to the top left, where you can see the princess and fight the guards who are surrounding her. There are three different places to place your flippers here, so there's a bit of strategy in completing this fight. Finally, you face Beezlebub, Dark Lord of the Machine, who guards the actual princess and throws skulls at you. Getting hit by these can damage your flippers and reduce your attack power. This is a difficult table because of how much space there is between your flippers. Though the candles in the middle of the table can save you a few times, it's very easy to lose a ball here. In the end, you do save the princess before getting sucked into a hole by a giant magnet. I'm honestly not sure what to make of this ending. Pinball Quest's RPG mode is a really cool idea. Now, there are a number of games that combine pinball mechanics with other genres. Games like Creature in the Well, Yoku's Island Express, or Rollers of the Realm. But in 1990, this was a very novel idea. However, the game is not without its faults. It's quite difficult to really lose the game. While I usually would like this, how the player is punished for losing a ball ends up being quite frustrating. If your ball goes down the drain, you end up going back a level, and losing half of your attack power. It's demoralizing to watch your ball fall down the previous table, unable to even hit it with your flippers until it reaches the very bottom. There were a few times where some unlucky rolls put me almost all the way back to the beginning of the adventure. 
and it's not that fun to replay the tables you've already beaten. I do like that the levels have a lot of moving parts and are all quite distinct, but they miss out on a big part of what makes pinball fun, the flashing lights and cool sound effects. Visually, there's very little pizzazz, and the sound effects aren't all that satisfying. The soundtrack is passable, but each table's theme does get quite repetitive. One visual element I did really like was the smooth scrolling. Before playing this, if you were to ask me to name an early console pinball game, I would have said Compile's Alien Crush on the TurboGrafx-16. While that game looks, sounds, and plays better, it does a disorienting hard cut between the top and bottom of the table. Other similar NES games, like High Speed and Pinbot, cut the screen so your bottom bumpers are always visible, which I don't really care for either. And then there's Nintendo's own Black Box Pinball, which just fits the entire table on one stationary screen. Of all of these, I prefer Pinball Quest's method of smoothly following the ball. I also liked what they tried to do with the combat. Having the ability to move your flippers up and down the board meant there was a bit of a strategic component to fighting enemies. You could move your flippers to avoid them getting hit and having them damaged or stunned. Pinball Quest is a unique game, and if you like the mechanics of pinball but are looking for something a little more, I recommend checking it out. With three regular tables and an RPG mode with six more tables, it offers a lot of variety, and though it can be frustrating, it can also be a lot of fun. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. Today, I'm talking about monsters. Little tiny ones. It's Monster in My Pocket. Monster in My Pocket was developed by Konami and released for NES in 1992. It's a platformer where you play as either a vampire or Frankenstein's monster and attempt to stop the evil warlock who has sent his monstrous henchmen after you. Monster in My Pocket was a media franchise in the 90s, first consisting of trading cards, then matchbox toys, a short run of comic books, an animated special, and even a board game. The video game has the same general concept as the comic book, where Warlock had attempted to use a shrinking spell on any monsters who stood against him, but ended up shrinking them all. It features all kinds of beasts, like Bigfoot, Cyclops, Manticores, and Harpies. I wouldn't usually have high expectations of a video game that was based on a line of toys, but Konami pumped out a lot of games based on licensed properties, and they were usually pretty good. This is one of the most simple platformers I've played. In terms of mechanics, there's not a ton to do. You can do a simple attack, jump, crouch, and double jump. The double jump is actually a nice addition. It feels good to use and is something you don't see a ton of on the NES. You can also find items in some levels, keys or screws. I initially thought these would open something, but it seems like they're just there for throwing at enemies. Each enemy is worth a certain amount of points, and if you get 500 points, you get a free life. You also have 5 hit points and can refill lost health using heart jars. There are 6 levels in the game. Since you're so tiny, you're usually seeing everyday objects appear larger than life. You'll go through a kitchen where you have to climb over cups and ice cubes and avoid heat from stove burners. There's a sewer level, because of course there is. A construction site will have you climbing chain-link fences and riding on cranes. As expected, each level ends in a boss fight against one of the more well-known monsters, and the final level has a boss rush where you'll face all the bosses in a row. This game is okay. It's perfectly playable, it controls well, there's just not a lot to it. Even at its very short runtime, I found it got repetitive. In terms of what you're doing in each level, you're just looking for the exit, while some enemies come at you from the ground and some from the sky. Enemies will often spawn behind you and come at you from both sides, but they're never too challenging to deal with. 
The levels do change things up a bit. They're not all straight left to right side scrollers. In some, there's a lot of verticality and you'll be climbing a fence or descending down a tunnel. Occasionally, you're moving right to left, but you're still basically doing the same thing. There are no power-ups or different forms to mix things up. The most novel things to happen are riding a crane while enemies fly at you, or speeding down a ramp, gaining so much speed that you can run right through enemies. But these parts don't last long, and don't happen often. The bosses are also quite basic. Though they look different, you'll be fighting Bigfoot, a Kraken, Medusa, most have very similar patterns. You have to get in a hit or two, then jump away from their attack. And repeat. Medusa is the one boss that's slightly different, as there are five versions of her that spawn around you, and you have to find the real one to attack. I also enjoyed that there was a bit of a fake out at the end. I thought I had won once I defeated Warlock, but I was wrong. Though you do get a choice between two characters to play as, they both play exactly the same. I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity to have Frankenstein's monster and the vampire have the exact same attack and move in the same way. Who you pick is really just a different skin. There is a two-player mode though which allows you to play at the same time, which is always nice as opposed to the games that make you take turns. This game reminds me quite a bit of Rescue Rangers with its co-op mode and use of larger-than-life everyday household objects for its levels. Much like the gameplay, the game's presentation is not overly impressive. The graphics aren't bad, they're perfectly serviceable. But when comparing Monster in My Pocket to other Konami games around the same time frame, like Zen Intergalactic Ninja or Bucky O'Hare, it kind of seems like the B team was working on this one. I do like the sprites for the vampire and monster. They're quite big and very detailed, and the animations are good. There's also a really good-looking close-up of Warlock on a TV screen at the beginning of the game. But the enemies and bosses aren't anything to write home about, and while I like seeing everyday objects that look gigantic, in terms of graphical detail and even color palette, I just kind of expected more from 1992 Konami. The backgrounds are all rather bland, and there is a lot of flicker that can make it hard to see your character when there's a lot happening on screen. The soundtrack, on the other hand, is pretty good. It's catchy and just a little spooky sounding, which fits the game very well. This is not an overly challenging game, it's one of the easier NES platformers. With your rather generous health bar and ability to heal, get extra lives, and three continues, it's not one that requires a lot of practice. If this game looks familiar to you, but you remember it with Batman, that's because there was a ROM hack made of this which was released in Asia that used sprites of Batman and The Flash instead of monsters. The rest of the game is the same. Monster in My Pocket was a little disappointing. It's got a cool concept and the mechanics are solid, there's just not enough to it. The game's easy, there's little variety, and for such a late release, I really think they could have done more to make it stand out from other platformers. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about video games. I talk about a fair number of NES games that could be considered hidden gems, and I try to shed some light on them. But today, I'm talking about a game that I think should stay hidden and never put into a console. It's Adventures of Dino Ricky. Adventures of Dino Ricky was developed by Hudson Soft and released on NES in North America in 1989, two and a half years after it was originally released in Japan. It's a vertically scrolling shooter, except you're walking instead of flying. It's kind of like Pocky and Rocky, except shitty. In this world, humans and dinosaurs exist at the same time, and as Ricky, you need to shoot the ones you see, along with bats, skulls, and other monsters, while avoiding their attacks. You have a small arsenal of weapons to help you. You start by throwing stones, which is very inefficient. By picking up power fists, you can upgrade to throwing axes, boomerangs, and finally, the power of fire. Of course, if you ever get hit by an enemy projectile, you lose some of your power and drop down a weapon level, making everything much more challenging. You have three health to start, but can refill it with meat, or can increase your total health by picking up hearts. 
you can also get speed boosts. The game starts out alright. The controls aren't the best and Ricky feels a little sluggish, but it's playable. But then the game asks you to start jumping. I have no idea why overhead auto-scrolling platforming was added to this game, because it is terrible. Halfway through the first stage, the game changes from a mediocre shooter to some hellish version of Frogger. The jungle you've been traveling through turns into a lake, where you need to hop between lily pads, some of which disappear and reappear or move around. The problems with the platforming in this game are plentiful. How the platforms look on screen doesn't really correspond to where the safe zones are when you land on them. So many times, I very much look to be on solid ground only to find myself falling to my death. The jump itself is also not reliable. Sometimes pressing jump and forward would launch me much further than I expected, while at other times Ricky would just do a little hop and fall into the water right in front of him. The speed boost can also really mess you up, changing the jumping physics at each different speed. But the worst part is that while the screen is auto-scrolling, Ricky is automatically inching forward all the time. In later levels, some of the platforms you need to jump between are tiny. Even if you land where you need to, you then often need to tap backwards to keep yourself from walking right off the edge while you line yourself up for the next jump. But when you jump on a moving platform, you don't automatically move with it. I know some of these games are Nintendo hard, but this is bullshit. The second level, which takes place in a desert, thankfully ditches the platforming. However, it is full of disappearing and reappearing quicksand traps. Level 3 is in a swamp, and it's where the teeny tiny platforms make an appearance, along with fissures appearing in the ground as you approach. As the game goes on, there are more and more enemies coming at you, shooting projectiles, moving erratically, while your sluggish avatar tries to avoid them. Each level ends in a boss fight, and comparatively, they are much less challenging than the rest of the game. They just move back and forth shooting at you and are pretty easy, though I did find a couple of them, like the giant cobra, took a very long time to kill. The final level takes the three environments you've already seen and places many, very challenging versions of them back to back. That means there's really only three environments in the entire game, plus the boss fight arena. I feel like Hudson Soft wasn't really putting in their best effort here. These last stages are a nightmare and ramp up the challenge to a ridiculous level. Any platforming segments go on for an unbearable amount of time. Even the sections where you're on solid ground complicate things by putting you on narrow paths between obstacles, so you have almost no room to dodge enemies. One particular enemy type did its best to ruin my day. Tiny skeletons which shot single projectiles. You could shoot them, making them collapse into a heap of bones, but the little bastards would just keep shooting at you, and if you came into contact with their apparently lifeless bodies, they'd still hurt you. With no way to shoot behind you, any enemy you fail to kill will just keep shooting at you from behind for a time. What fun! Also, these final stages have no checkpoints, so if you die, you go back to the start. Again, each of these shorter stages ends in a boss fight, which repeat the ones you've seen before. There's one last awful desert stage, which is full of timed spouting fire, quicksand, and more enemies than I knew what to do with. There's practically nowhere to maneuver at this point, and unless you somehow manage to not take any hits and keep your most powerful weapon, it's next to impossible to clear a safe path through. And then you reach the final boss. After fighting a giant cobra, a tyrannosaurus, the final boss is… a big fly. Sure, why not? On all the previous bosses, there was a little calm before the storm when you reach the entrance to the boss room. A second, where there were no enemies and usually a power-up or two to grab before going in. For this final one, there's just a big fuck you, try to make it to the door in one piece. So I ended up going at the final boss with just my rocks. After all this nonsense, can you guess what you're rewarded with? The worst kind of NES ending. It just loops back to stage one. Congratulations, you just made it through this piece of shit game. 
Now do it again. There are a few more power-ups I haven't mentioned which are ostensibly supposed to help make things easier. A star will clear any enemies around you. Helpful, sure, but they often spawn in bad places. There's also a bird which will let Ricky fly. If you hold down the jump button, he hovers over the ground, still able to shoot, but not able to pick up items. This could make the platforming sections much easier, but if you get hit at all or stop holding the jump button, you lose the wings. Also, they're a hidden power-up. You need to shoot the right place on screen to make them appear. There's nothing to indicate where they are, and I think I saw maybe two of these while I played. The last upgrade that apparently exists is Macho Ricky. This makes you bigger and lets you throw copies of yourself. I say it apparently exists because I never saw this power-up in my entire playthrough. Alright, what else is there aside from the awful gameplay? The soundtrack is fine. It's very Hudson Soft. As I said, there's really only three environments, none of them are that great looking. Some of the bosses look alright, I do love me some dinosaurs, but I honestly got really tired of watching Ricky die. Look at this googly-eyed asshole. Playing through Adventures of Dino Ricky kind of ruined my day. I was angrily messaging friends, threatening to take a hammer to this cartridge, and I might have done it if this label wasn't so nice and clean. But this is one of the most frustrating, least fun NES games I've ever played. Do yourself a favor, don't play this. Hi, I'm Pam and I'm here to talk about retro video games. You know what NES games need more of? Dogs. And not the jerks who laugh at you when you fail. The helpful, loyal kind. The ones who are always by your side. Man's best friend. Today, I'm talking about a game with a great dog. It's Conquest of the Crystal Palace. Conquest of the Crystal Palace was developed by Quest and released for NES in 1990. You play a boy named Farron, who finds out that he is the Prince of the Kingdom of the Crystal Palace, which had been taken over by the evil Zerus when he was just a baby. You're told this by your faithful dog, Zap, who is actually a keeper of the palace, and starts you on a quest to take your kingdom back. When you first start up the game, you're given the choice between three crystals to improve one of your attributes, either your life meter, attack ability, or jump height. I took the jump height, but the choice here doesn't matter for long as you'll get the chance to obtain the other power-ups as you play. Crystal Palace plays like a typical platformer, with a few twists to make it more interesting. Your main weapon is a sword, but as you play, you can either find or buy other new attacks, such as the ability to throw fireballs or shoot wave beams. As you defeat enemies, they'll drop various items. Usually, it will be money to spend in the game shop, but occasionally you'll get items to restore health, weapon upgrades and special powers, or armor that lets you avoid taking damage the next time you get hit. There are two things that really differentiate this game from all the other platformers out there. The first is your dog, Zap. By holding down and pressing A, you can call Zap to assist you. He pretty much does his own thing, jumping around and attacking anything hostile on screen. He can be extremely helpful in taking out hard-to-reach enemies or when you're feeling overwhelmed. Zap is a special ability which you can trigger by pressing up on the D-pad if you have the dog whistle item. This will make him extra aggressive and spin around you, taking out anything that's putting you in danger. Zap has his own health bar and you don't want to let it run out or he'll disappear. He'll also compete with you for any health drops. If he's closer to it when it falls on the ground, he's eating it. This is a very familiar scenario. You can get Zap to go away the same way you called him. The second coolest thing is the in-game shop run by Kim. You'll have a chance to visit her multiple times in each level. The shop interface is very unique, letting you scroll through the items available and getting a short description of each. There are also newscasts that you can watch, which will give you information about the zone you're in. Though the information isn't always all that useful. In the fire stage, the news told me that I needed a fuego weapon in order to defeat the final boss, and that didn't end up being true. 
But still, the news is a cool addition that adds some extra story and gives you a little break. Kim will show you how each new weapon option works and likes it when you spend money. But don't waste her time if you can't afford the wares. In addition to weapons, you can also buy healing for both yourself and Zap, and increase your lives, maximum health, or jumping power. Item costs will go up throughout the game. Something that starts out at 1500 can easily cost triple that when you get further on, so it's not always possible to plan your purchases. There are a few places where you can farm money from enemies constantly dropping from the sky, and these spots really come in handy. In terms of difficulty, Conquest of the Crystal Palace is tough, but fair. Mostly. Given the size of your life bar, you can take a number of hits before dying, and use Kim's shop to top up your health when it gets low. Some enemy attacks are hard to avoid, but most don't hit too hard. Of course, there are a few spots you need to memorize in order to avoid getting knocked back into a pit, which is an instant death. A few of these parts were kind of frustrating, but I've never been a fan of knockbacks. You get three lives, but there are unlimited continues, which is something I always appreciate. You start back at the beginning of the stage, but you do get to keep your gold so you can buy upgrades quickly. For the most part, the controls are decent. Your character is easy to move, and there's a lot of variability in your jump depending on how you tap the button or if you swing your sword. This comes in handy especially on levels where the ceiling does damage to you and you need to make your jumps as low as possible. There was a good balance in the stages of danger coming from both enemies and the environment. There's a lot of timing involved in getting past obstacles, like waterfalls or riding moving platforms while enemies jump at you from below or off screen. My one complaint about the controls is that holding down and pressing A to either call Zap or switch from your sword to your magic attack is a little cumbersome, especially if you're in the middle of a fight. Meanwhile, the select button doesn't seem to be used for anything and could have been a better option for this. Conquest of the Crystal Palace has only five stages, but most of them are quite long and they're all unique. I really like Stage 1's mountain climb and seeing it turn from day to night as you progress. Stage 2's Realm of the Guardian is probably the best looking one. It's an ornate palace with cracking columns and clouds floating by in the background whenever you pass a window. If you fall into a pit in this level, you just go back a bit rather than losing a life, and if you drop into a specific pit, you'll be given a very powerful spell. Lair of the Hungry Ghosts is kinda creepy, with its walls made of creatures screaming in pain and spikes lining the ceiling. It's also just a really good name for a level. The Gateway of Flame is the shortest stage, but also one of the most dangerous, with lava constantly threatening you from both above and below. And the final stage is the Crystal Palace itself. It looks similar to Stage 2, but its more muted and grey color palette gives it a completely different feel, and it's also a bit of a maze with multiple levels and lots of staircases. The bosses in the game are a bit of a mixed bag. Stages 2 and 5 have giant, ornate-looking bosses that are very impressive to look at and challenging to fight. But then there's the Stage 4 boss, which is just this little ball thing. The environment is really what's providing the challenge here. When you finally get to Zerus, he's honestly a little silly looking, and if you stand as close to him as possible and time your jumps, he's not all that much of a threat. I do think this is a very good looking game. The colors are nice, and the sprites for Farron, Kim, and Zap are all really adorable. It also has a very attractive interface. I really like the design of your status bar at the bottom of the screen, and Kim's shop looks like something that could have come from a game in the next generation of consoles. Music is similarly very good throughout. The Stage 1 and Shop themes are so energetic and catchy. Stage 3's music is appropriately creepy, and Stage 4 might just be my favorite. It's dramatic and also pretty rockin'. 
Music was composed by Masaharu Iwata, who would go on to compose a number of notable game soundtracks, like Final Fantasy Tactics and Shadow Hearts. Conquest of the Crystal Palace looks great, sounds great, and is a lot of fun to play. Plus, it has a very good dog who wears a sharp-looking suit of armor. What more could you ask for? If this is one you haven't tried yet, I definitely recommend giving it a play. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. It's been a while since I reviewed an NES game, so today I'm talking about an interesting combination of point-and-click adventure and brawler. It's Nightshade. Listen to this. That's what my Nintendo tapes are supposed to sound like, right? Nightshade was developed by Beam Software and released for the NES in 1992. Though it seems like something that would have been developed for some kind of home computer system and ported over, nope, it was only for the NES. The game takes place in Metro City, a place full of crime and corruption and now controlled by a crime lord who calls himself Sutek. Only one man stood against him, the superhero Vortex. Sadly, Vortex was killed. But then, another man, who was really just a nerd and a fan of Vortex, decided to take up the fight as the titular hero, Nightshade. When we first meet Nightshade, things aren't looking so hot for him. Sutek has him tied to a chair with a bomb nearby set to explode. Then, like any overconfident monologuing supervillain, Sutek leaves. This is where the game starts for the player, as they need to quickly find a way to escape before being blown to smithereens. I've always been of the opinion that the NES is not an ideal platform for point-and-click adventure games. The controller just doesn't do them justice. However, Nightshade manages to pull this off better than most. The game makes the most of the limited buttons available, and I found myself getting comfortable with the UI pretty quickly. You move Nightshade around the screen with the D-pad. Hovering your cursor over something and pressing A looks at it, while pressing B operates it. The less used commands can be accessed by pressing Select, which gives options like Pick Up, Talk, Use, Inventory, and even Jump, which will come in handy to hop over dangerous ground. The only thing I really didn't get used to was the speed at which the cursor moves. Boy, is it slow. At the bottom of the screen, you get a close-up of the hero, his face obscured by his fedora and upturned trench coat collar. You also have meters for health, which is pretty self-explanatory, and popularity, which you can increase by doing good deeds. There are some places you can't go, or people who won't talk to you if your popularity isn't high enough. The game offers over 50 screens for you to explore. Most only have a couple things that you can interact with, and you'll want to look at them all to find things like hidden keys and switches which let you progress. I'm impressed by the lack of pixel hunting here. There are some bricks out on the street which can be hard to spot at first, but once you find one and realize that objects marked with a V should be interacted with, they become much easier to spot. Some screens have enemies you need to fight, and there are a number of bosses you need to defeat in order to complete the game. I like the genre mashup, but the combat wasn't really my favorite, and I found the pace of it at odds with the adventure part of the game. Combat takes place directly on the screen you're on, and you can move back and forth, punch, kick, duck, and jump. The UI will also change so you can see enemy health. Enemies move surprisingly fast, considering how slow Nightshade moves for most of the game. There are a few different kinds of enemies, and each has their own pattern and weaknesses. Some need to be jumped over and hit in the back. One boss requires you to bait him into stunning himself before he'll be open to attack. I found combat quite challenging, and it wasn't until I started making use of jumping over enemies and ducking a lot that I started doing okay at these fights. If you take too much damage in one fight, it can put you in a real tight spot for the next. When you lose all your health, you die, which brings us to one of the cooler aspects of the game. Rather than the usual game over screen, Sutek, overconfident as always, puts you in a death trap, and then leaves. 
There's a way to get out of these, though they are reliant on both correct timing and positioning. If you fail, then it's really game over. But if you escape, you get to continue on with all your items and a full health bar. So in this way, the game has continues, though there are only four of them. When you get to the fifth and final death trap, there is no escape. This great take on the continue system and the overall tone that combines noir with superheroes is what makes the game shine. The writing is also surprisingly good and quite funny. I like that the game's introduction sets up the story for you, rather than just dumping you into the world like some other NES adventures. You also get a real conclusion at the end. Even if you die prematurely, you get a little scene and a note on how far you progressed, rather than just a game over screen. As you talk to people out in the world, they'll call you Lampshade and question where your leotards are. Sutek and his minions are all quite sassy towards you, and the exclamation, great quivering enigmas with a side salad and a light tartar sauce, gave me a laugh. When you reach the final fight of the game, Sutek reveals that in his new world, game shows will run on TV 24 hours a day and flares will come back into style. This made me question if Nightshade's quest to defeat him was one I really wanted to support. I love game shows. The game is very open, you can explore most places right from the start as long as you're willing to get in a few fights. It also does a pretty good job telegraphing what you should be looking out for. As long as you talk to everyone and look at everything, you'll get hints about things you should be doing. However, some things are not that obvious, like certain items making some enemies weaker or scaring them off entirely. So there is some trial and error in terms of how to succeed. A game like this could really use saves, so I encourage the use of save states. You can heal yourself a limited number of times in a secret hideout, and you do have the four continues, but that may not be enough. In addition to taking damage in combat, there's also occasional environmental dangers, like steam spouts in the sewers, rats, or defense turrets around enemy strongholds. In terms of aesthetics, Nightshade looks and sounds pretty good. The music is jazzy and conveys the tone of each area. While out on the street, things are more chill and laid back. While in dangerous areas, the tempo picks up and contrasts bassy notes with more high-pitched sounds. The main theme in particular really captures the noir feeling. Sound effects are also good, and when you're in combat, the punching sound effects are sufficiently weighty. The game also makes great use of the NES's limited color palette. Nightshade himself is mostly orange, but with enough use of light and shadow to make him distinct. I also love that he has an idle pose. I'm always a sucker for those. Most areas look great. The sewers make excellent use of dithering to give real texture to the stone columns that you can walk behind and moldy looking green walls. While you're outside, the sky always looks great by using multiple shades of blue, so it never looks flat. There's one area of the city that uses that awful magenta color a little too much, but hey, they only have so many colors to choose from. If you pay attention to the startup screen of the game, you'll notice that the full title is Nightshade Part 1, The Claws of Sutek. This was maybe a little optimistic on the part of the devs, as a part 2 would never happen. It's a shame, really, as this game ended up being quite impressive. A sequel on Super Nintendo could have been a winner. Nightshade is a very charming game. The combat does take a little getting used to and may be a little out of place, but as an adventure game, especially on the NES, it succeeds. The writing and setting are a lot of fun, there's no shortage of clues to let you know what you should be looking out for, and it makes the most of the limited options offered by the NES controller. Nightshade is a game with a lot of style and is definitely worth checking out. Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about retro video games. So when I first started my channel, I focused on the handful of NES games that I owned and played as a kid. Felix the Cat, Star Tropics, Hudson Hawk, for better or for worse. But there's one game that I used to play a lot that I never made a video on, because how much could I really say about it? 
Well, I've thought of some things to say. It's Monopoly. Monopoly, based on the board game of the same name, was developed by Sculptured Software and released for the NES in 1991. These developers would also make the Game Boy version, which is very similar, and the versions for Super Nintendo and Genesis, which are fairly different. Monopoly is an economics-themed board game with the objective of buying properties with which you can collect rent from the other players. You win by driving everyone else into bankruptcy while getting rich yourself. For almost 90 years, the game has been teaching folks terrible lessons. That becoming a rich, ruthless real estate mogul while the rest of society can't pay to put a roof over their heads is something to aspire to. And that being a landlord is a real job. The video game brings the board game to consoles without the tedium and mess of having to set up the board, keep track of fake money, or worrying about losing and then stepping on one of those tiny green plastic houses. It also speeds things up considerably. I've always been a huge fan of games, not just video games, but board games, card games, game shows, and as a 10-year-old I spent a somewhat worrying amount of time playing Monopoly by myself in my room. I had friends, really, but who the hell else wants to play Monopoly? You can play the game with two to eight players, any combination of humans and computers. There's a gallery of eight computer characters you can select from to play against, and they all look like rich assholes. You can start the game from scratch or choose a number of options, like putting a time limit on things, or you can use the game editor to tinker with starting money, placements, and properties. Once things get started, you're presented with a top-down view of the board. While you can't see the names of each space from this view, it's all very clear and easy to keep track of. A hand appears over the board and rolls the dice, then you watch your chosen token travel to its space. Here you get a close-up, which gives you the choice of buying the property you've landed on or sending it to auction. Or you pay rent if someone else already owns it. The UI also updates to show a representation of all properties, graying out those which are owned by opponents and showing your own in color. Every action has a little animation to go along with it. A cash register gobbles up the appropriate bills when you need to pay something, greenbacks fall from the sky when you pass go and collect $200, and a hammer builds houses as they are purchased. The menu is also very clear and intuitive, giving you a place to make trades with other players, view anyone's assets, mortgage or unmortgage properties, or buy houses if you have all properties of one color. The pace of the game is pretty good. All of the animations are snappy, so you're not spending too much time just watching the computer players do their thing. However, if you're impatient, you can also tell the game to hurry up to make turns even faster and speed up animations. Occasionally, the AI for computer players can be annoying, like when they keep trying to make the same trade over and over when you don't agree the first time. They don't know how to take no for an answer. However, their single-mindedness can also be taken advantage of. Most computer players will be willing to trade pretty much everything they have in order to complete a color group of properties. They also don't notice when things are mortgaged. So, if they want something from you, you can mortgage it first, then trade it, costing them money and giving you some extra. Design flaw in the game? Possibly. Or maybe the creators just wanted to let the market decide. According to Wikipedia, there are 28 different video game versions of Monopoly, which I think is lowballing it by quite a bit. After spending so much time with NES Monopoly, every other version I tried was a bit of a disappointment. What makes this one so special? It's the sound effects. The game doesn't really have a soundtrack as much as a series of short jingles for a huge amount of actions. There's the theme song, which is quite catchy, but there's no backing track for the actual game. However, unless you're idle during your turn, things are never silent. It starts with the dice roll, then the bassy thumping of your token moving across the board. Comparing it to the Super Nintendo version, which does boast some nicer animations and graphics, it's just so much more satisfying to roll and move on NES. The Game Boy version, while visually almost identical other than being in black and white, tries its best, but the sound chip doesn't quite cut it. 
I also tried getting into the PlayStation game, but it is dull. Lifeless animations, background music that sounds like something you'd hear in an elevator, and underwhelming sound effects. As you play on NES, you'll hear the sound of a sold stamp coming down when you buy a property, or music and a cash register noise when you pay rent. The music for rent paying is slightly different for every single character. There's also music when the menu is opened, and it too has eight different variations. Composer Paul Webb did not need to go this hard, but I appreciate that he did. Pulling a community chest card has a jingle, and Chance has one too. The noise when you land on the income tax space is especially dramatic. As rich landowners, the idea of not being able to exploit tax loopholes to avoid giving anything back is quite offensive. There are also a few voice lines used, like when you get out of jail or an auction concludes. Considering how human voices are not one of the NES's fortes, I think they sound pretty good. Don't be coming back now. This cartridge brings the rules of the board game Monopoly to life, but improves upon it by just being more efficient. But did you know that before Monopoly was published in 1935, a very similar game with a very different ideal was invented by someone who would never get the credit for it? The original rules and board for the game that would become Monopoly were created in the early 1900s by Elizabeth McGee. She called her game The Landlord's Game, and it was meant to show the downsides and inequality created by a system of land grabbing and rent gouging. The game included two sets of rules. In one, all were rewarded when wealth was created. In the other, the goal was to amass individual wealth and crush the competition. McGee patented her game in 1903, and it became popular on college campuses, with progressive individuals, and with Quakers. Thirty years later, it made its way into the notice of Charles Darrow, who would drop the more progressive half of the rules and sell Monopoly to Parker Brothers. The game company would also buy the rights to the Landlord's Game, but for a relative pittance and just to prevent it from infringing on the territory of Monopoly, not to actually produce or sell it. This purpose was unknown to Elizabeth when she agreed to sell. She would never get any official recognition or make any royalties for her original invention of the game. And its purpose? To contrast two economic systems and highlight the problems of monopolies and income inequality would be completely subverted. So that's Monopoly. If you really want to play it, I feel like this version is the way to go. It takes a game that can honestly be overly long and get a little tedious, and turns it into something much more entertaining. Remember though, this is just a game. In reality, you should know that monopolies are bad. Owning and renting land is not actual labor, and housing should be a human right. If you want to see more, check out my old, old, old video on Felix the Cat. Or something else. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.